Thank you. <laughs> I miscounted what can I tell you? Okay. Well, good morning. My name is Jeff Moore. I'm Senior Vice President and Chief Development Officer with Altarum Institute, which is a nonprofit health systems research and consulting organization, as I hope many of you know. Thank you very much for joining us this morning for what promises to be certainly a very well-informed, and we also hope maybe even a little bit provocative conversation about sustainable health spending and the U.S. budget. It is a sad thing, I think, perhaps a sad commentary on the degree of dysfunction in our elected leadership to be hoping, albeit maybe rather privately, that the fiscal cliff looming before us in five months might this time actually focus us and force some painful, necessary fiscal choices. Maybe we should all be channeling a little bit of Winston Churchill about now, counting on America to finally do the right thing after trying everything else. While some of the answers about how we get from our current state of fiscal peril to a more secure financial path might lack complete clarity, one thing is abundantly clear, absolute. There is no getting to the other side of this fiscal chasm without coming to a common understanding of what a sustainable rate of health spending looks like for this nation and quantifying it and setting measures against which we can track national performance. This is one of the critical systems issues defining a picture of sustainability that Altarum Institute has taken on as a pillar of its internally funded research and demonstration agenda. Of course, we don't wade into this work alone. Our Center for Sustainable Health Spending has an extraordinary national advisory committee, and many of its members are on our panel today. They inform how we think, and they sometimes challenge our assumptions as they should. Our thanks to them and to all of our speakers for joining us here this morning. We also have wonderful partners like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Brookings Institution that help make these discussions possible. And we're especially thankful to RWJ and to Brookings for their support of today's symposium. Of course, there's a lot for us to talk about here. The agenda is full. But there are just a few housekeeping comments before we get started with our first speaker. First, we hope that you will join us for a light lunch uh, following the session. The rooms will be cooled off by then, I'm sure. And please use the opportunity to share your thoughts and your questions with our speakers at that time. Second, the session is being webcast, and a full recording of the event will be available on Altarum's website in the very near future. So we hope that you will take a look and share the link. And finally, there will be a monograph for the session, uh, which our center staff will be preparing, and that, too, will be made widely available. So again, thank you for joining us and for engaging fully in this critical conversation. And let me now turn to Cece Connolly, one of our National Advisory Committee members and someone well known to most, if not all of you here in the room to make our opening moderator comments. Cece. Jeff, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I know, it's, it's warm, right? Otherwise, you'd, you'd be giving me an, an even warmer greeting. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to be joining this group today. I, I do have a little bit of a bias as, as one of the advisory board members. I'm, I'm a big fan of Altarum, and I have been for quite some time. Uh, the phenomenon of skyrocketing medical costs 
is not terribly new. As you all know, since 1970, healthcare costs per capita have grown about 2.4 percentage points faster than GDP. Families, of course, feel that burden. We hear from employers that their medical tab is really impacting competitiveness here and, of course, overseas. And obviously, the growing health care budget threatens our ability as a nation to climb out of debt and pursue other priority issues. But we also know that all health care spending is not created equal. As the center has documented in this sluggish economic recovery, the health sector has been one of the bright spots on the job creation front. And for a wealthy nation, shouldn't health be one of our top spending priorities? The riddle, of course, is determining how much is the right amount. And that brings us to today, and a rather unique effort to answer that question. In a series of presentations with discussants adding on, we hope to delve deeper into an issue that is so important that the Altarium Institute put it in the title of its healthcare center. Where are we today with respect to healthcare spending? Where are we headed? Can we alter that path? And if so, how? Those are a couple of the simple questions that we're gonna put before our group today. Uh, one other housekeeping note, there is a microphone up here in the aisle. If you'd like to comment or ask a question at any time, we do encourage you to come up because things are being webcast. Uh, to keep us on schedule, I want to, without further ado, um, invite Alice Rivlin to uh, come up and speak to you. Um, we're going to do away with lengthy introductions because really you know all of the folks speaking here today and we all have pasts. We're all former something somethings. So it's much easier to just let you know that at the moment Alice Rivlin is a senior fellow of economic studies at the Brookings Institution. Thank you, Cece. Um, can I just stay here? Sure. This conference raises a very important question. Uh, budget wonks like me uh, have been throwing this word unsustainable around uh, with great abandon uh, for a long time. Uh, we claim that the federal budget is on an unsustainable path, that projected deficits and debt increases are unsustainable. Uh, we claim further that projected growth in health <laughs> spending is to blame, uh, that uh, it is not realistic to get to a sustainable federal budget without slowing the growth of health spending in the federal budget, uh, often known as, uh, as bending uh, the curve. Uh, so what are we talking about? I will talk about it, but I want to warn you in advance that there is no single answer uh, to this question. Uh, it depends on what you want to give up, how highly you give value uh, health care, uh, what you want to give up to get it, and what you want to get up, uh, give up to get it produced more efficiently so you can have more of, uh, of something else. Uh, a few years ago, I was at a conference of very earnest uh, defense analysts. Uh, and uh, they, uh, like you, cared a lot about national security. Uh, and uh, their question was, OK, economists, uh, what is a sustained, well, how much defense can we afford? Just give us a number. And then we will do the best we can uh, with that uh, amount of resources uh, to defend the country effectively. That sounded very reasonable to them. Uh, and they were very disappointed when I said, there is no such number. Uh, you have to decide, we all have to decide collectively uh, what the threats are, uh, what the probabilities that we will have to face them are, uh, and whether it's productive or not to do it in different uh, different ways. And uh, healthcare is like that. But uh, let me start with an easy question to which I actually think there is an answer. Uh, what is a sustainable path for the federal budget first? Uh, <clears throat> I think we can answer that question, uh, and uh, we, if we don't answer it, we're in real trouble. 
the answer to the question, what is a sustainable uh, federal budget, is one in which our debt is not growing faster than our economy, not growing faster uh, than our uh, uh, GDP. Now, uh, that means, it doesn't mean we have to balance a budget. Uh, it does mean that we can't run a deficit which is uh, uh, bigger uh, than the incremental growth uh, in the economy. Um, uh, if we can grow our economy, and we're not at the moment, but if we get back to a normal situation in which we're growing our economy <clears throat> at at least uh, 3%, um, then if we want to, it uh, doesn't say we have to, uh, we uh, can run a deficit of, say, 1% or 2% uh, and uh, not get uh, into any uh, serious trouble. Uh, so the goal is to stabilize uh, the debt at some reasonable ratio to uh, the size of the economy. Um, and uh, I've been now on, it seems like dozens, it's probably only three or four, uh, budget commissions that have all uh, asked this question at the very beginning. So, okay, what's a reasonable ratio? The Simpson-Bowles Commission, uh, the um, uh, Domenici Rivlin Commission, a couple of others, uh, all uh, coalesced around uh, 60%. But of course, saying there is no uh, magic number. Uh, and please note that our debt, and I speak here of the debt held by the public, not counting uh, the debt held by uh, the government itself, uh, is now over 70% um, of, uh, of GDP and rising, which is why we think it's not uh, sustainable. Now, uh, we've been at different levels uh, over our history. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, the, our debt was uh, well over uh, G, uh, the size of the GDP, 108% uh, of GDP in uh, 1940. <coughs> 46. It drifted down uh, to about 24% in 1974, not because we were tired debt or ran surpluses, we rarely did, uh, but uh, for the reasons that I was uh, alluding to earlier, we grew the economy faster than we grew, uh, than we grew the debt, uh, pretty consistently uh, over about uh, 30 years. And then it began to move up again in the 80s uh, with uh, the big, uh, with the Cold War and the Reagan tax cuts uh, and uh, into the 90s. And we were really worried about it uh, in, the, in the sort of high 40% uh, in, uh, in, uh, in that period. Uh, and uh, we got control of it. Uh, we balanced the budget for several years in the late 90s uh, and got it coming down again. Uh, and uh, came down uh, to about 36% of GDP. Okay, now it's shot up again, 74%, and rising. And it's the and <coughs> rising that is the worry about uh, uh, sustainability. Um, and it matters. Uh, it matters because we could have a loss of confidence in our, uh, in our ability to pay back. We could have suddenly much higher interest rates. And the higher your debt is relative to your economy, the worse that hurts you. Uh, we're, uh, we used to say we're not Greece. Well, we're not Greece. Now we say we're not Italy. We're not Spain. Uh, well, it's not so clear that we can count on being different uh, for, very, for very long. But the one thing that can be said for sure uh, about is that any country whose debt continues to rise faster than its economy is growing is going to get into trouble uh, at some point, and we're certainly in a danger zone. We can't count on being saved by our status as the world's strongest economy or the fact that other countries are in worse shape or our past good record of paying our debts. Um, so uh, we've got a definition there. We're not on a sustainable track uh, now. 
Uh, uh, Joe's got some nifty charts that he's going to show about this in a minute, so I don't have to. Uh, but uh, our, if we uh, don't uh, stay on uh, track, uh, if, if we don't get off the track we're on, uh, if we don't change our policy from current policy, and note I said current policy, not current law, <coughs> Uh, we uh, we will eventually be in in trouble. So why is the budget outlook uh, so unsustainable? Well, uh, because federal spending is projected to grow faster than the GDP, uh, and that's due to the aging of the population and the projected cost of. Uh, of health care. It's not due to any of the things that they're arguing about in the campaign. Uh, the, the wars, uh, the, uh, the uh, recession, uh, the, ta the past tax cuts uh, basically are irrelevant to this uh, prospect uh, uh, going forward. Uh, so this is the basic reason why all the serious bipartisan efforts uh, to stabilize the debt come out at the same place. Uh, stabilizing the debt from where we are now will take reducing the growth of health care spending and increasing revenues because nobody thinks we can uh, get the spending down uh, fast enough uh, not to need uh, more revenues, and revenues are extraordinarily low at the moment. Health programs, and to a lesser extent, much lesser extent, Social Security, are the only uh, growth items uh, in the projections. So what's a sustainable rate of growth for federal health programs? Now, you'd think going in uh, that uh, rev uh, spending can't grow much faster than revenues. And revenues, no matter what we do to the tax system, will grow about as fast as the economy does. Uh, so as a first approximation, you might say, we'd like to get health spending down so it isn't growing any faster than the GDP. Uh, but we said earlier that uh, we could afford a little deficit, so probably it's GDP plus, uh, plus uh, something. Uh, but that <coughs> assumes that nothing else in the federal budget is growing faster uh, than the GDP. Now, that's not a bad assumption if we keep the lid on domestic discretionary spending, as we have been, and don't let it grow faster, maybe slower, it's been growing slower, uh, than the GDP. And we don't have any more big wars, and we don't let uh, and we don't uh, lose the confidence of world markets so that our interest rate is kill uh, is uh, and the debt service uh, is killing us. Uh, we have to accommodate a little bit of growth for the Social Security uh, uh, beneficiaries, but we can presumably keep that from adding uh, to the deficit <coughs> by getting in some more revenues and or changing the benefits in some way, adjusting the formula, changing the... Uh, uh, a retirement age, um, et cetera. So one could propose uh, that our, the answer to this question is roughly at the outside, we don't want uh, uh, health spending in the federal budget to grow faster than GDP plus, say, 1% uh, as a reasonable uh, uh, target. OK, we already have that target. Um, it's built uh, for Medicare uh, into uh, the, uh, a, uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the uh, IPAB uh, is charged with keeping growth at uh, GDP uh, plus 1% uh, or lower by changing Medicare payment incentives or whatever else it is allowed uh, to do. Uh, Simpson Bowles adopted a similar uh, target, uh, so did we in uh, uh, Domenici Rivlin. Now, how, how hard is it? There's some evidence that healthcare spending growth, especially Medicare growth, has slowed uh, recently. Uh, can we assume uh, that the IPAB will continue, that it will do its job, that it will uh, be successful, and that may not be very hard for a while? One of the things that will make it easier with respect to Medicare uh, is that all those retirees are young 65-year-olds, uh, and uh, the, so that the demographics are favorable for a while. Uh, the Medicare population, on the average, uh, will get... Uh, 
will get younger uh, for a while. But there are a lot of ifs, and in uh, the out years beyond the 10-year window for which it is projecting that uh, things will be quite favorable, the CBO assumes after that spending growth speeds uh, up again. Now, obviously, these are kind of outside limits. We shouldn't spend more than we need to to get good results. And the evidence of waste and inefficiency as well as poor quality in the system uh, is, uh, is all around us, uh, and especially in uh, fee-for-service Medicare. And there are plenty of ideas about uh, how to improve providers' incentives to deliver more cost-effective care and <coughs> patients' incentives to, uh, to seek it out bundling payments, coordination, affordable care uh, uh, organizations, integrated health systems paid on a capitated basis, uh, insurance uh, with higher patient cost sharing, um, all, in my opinion, ought to be pursued, but the real question is how. Uh, and at the moment, uh, the, our polarized politics and the conversation on the Hill uh, has, at least in my perception, uh, kind of brought us to a dead stop uh, because uh, there is a perceived conflict between those who want to do all of these good things and better incentives by regulation uh, through the IPAB in Medicare and hope that that spreads to the rest of the uh, of the uh, system, uh, and those who want to do it uh, by competition, uh, by having uh, integrated capitated plans compete uh, on an exchange and hope that the most cost effective ones uh, win. So, uh, uh, Joe and I have been part of that discussion, many of you have, uh, but uh, the uh, answer that we have in the Domenici Rivlin plan is, let's do both. Uh, keep uh, fee-for-service Medicare for people who want it uh, and uh, allow it to compete uh, in the marketplace uh, with uh, other plans, and I could give you the details, but I will talk too long if I do, uh, and uh, uh, that is a solution that uh, should appeal to both parties, but at the moment doesn't, uh, because there is too much fear and distrust on both sides uh, to, uh, to come to any kind of a compromise. But if we, even if we get the incentives right and we develop good quality measures and good ways of rewarding them, which is a lot to say, uh, we're still going to have big choices. Uh, as research gets more elaborate and uh, expensive ways of extending life, we're going to have to make some decisions. We can't assume that more health care is always better. Better than what? Better than education, better than recreation, better than investing in the future of our young people? Not obviously. Anyway, nothing's easy. Thank you. Alice, thank you very much. Um, Joe, Alice promises that you have nifty charts for oh, us. We'll see. So um, we we hope that they are. I, you know, Joe, I, w I was struck by by some of the discussion here. I mean, Alice, you said we're in a danger zone, and that 70 to 74 percent public debt and rising is a pretty frightening um, perspective that, that we're in right now. Maybe you can speak a little bit to that as well with your nifty chart. Sure. Well, we'll see. Um, I hope this works. Yes. Ah, okay. Good. There's a surprise. Um, <clears throat> so um, yeah, Alice and I have been hanging out uh, for a long time. Uh, so you're not going to hear uh, much disagreement between the two of us about uh, not only what the problem is, but also largely what the, what the uh, I, don't, I can't say solution, but uh, what policies we should try next. Uh, I have a feeling that even if we tried our favorite policies, that 10, maybe 15 years from now, uh, we could meet and we'd identify other issues that require uh, equally dramatic uh, changes, but ideally the fundamental circumstances would have changed. Uh, unfortunately, however, they haven't uh, changed in this country for, well, I'd say 45 years and, and counting. Uh, so um, 
Uh, here's the first uh, possibly nifty chart, thanks to the Washington Post. I really love this chart. I wish they'd update it. Uh, but this, this illustrates uh, Alice's point. Now, the, the lower line actually uh, is uh, total federal debt, not just debt subject to limit. And uh, so that includes uh, 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 debt held by the public, but it also includes essentially the IOUs that Social Security, Medicare, and some other programs uh, um, uh, have uh, in place. I think this is the, this is the right way to look at it uh, because it, it characterizes uh, not just the immediate term problem that you see when you look at uh, a debt, debt high, held by the public, uh, but it also gives you some sense, although short-term sense, it doesn't tell you over the long term, it gives you some sense about just how deep a fiscal hole we're in. And of course, uh, you know, if you're in a fiscal hole uh, and you want to get out of it, you have to stop digging, which uh, so far, uh, no such luck. An interesting part of this chart to me is uh, uh, that uh, even... Um, Starting in, uh, looks to me like about 83 or so, the economy uh, came back to life. And even with a growing economy, which we saw off and on between, say, 1950 and then, uh, even with a growing economy, uh, we, the uh, health or the, the debt uh, started rising. Uh, that, that trend is a troubling trend. It's not all due to healthcare, but it's certainly, healthcare has a lot to do with it. Uh, and then uh, more recently, uh, the recent recession, you can see uh, this uh, sudden explosion of debt uh, related somewhat to the hope that fiscal stimulus would, would get us out of our economic problems, somewhat related, again, to uh, the entitlement programs. Uh, so uh, where are we today? I looked this up yesterday. Uh, as of July 19th, uh, national debt was $15.9 trillion. Uh, debt subject to limit, uh, the, uh, oh, let's see, actually I don't have that, do I? Sorry. Debt subject to limit, the limit is $16.4 trillion. Um, uh, I'm not sure actually how much uh, debt uh, right now is, uh, it falls into that category, but it's pretty close to $15.9 trillion. Uh, and then the, the other contrast is the first quarter GDP was $15.5 trillion. So, so these are not numbers that are very good. Um, uh, if, you, if you think in terms of, of just debt subject uh, to uh, limit uh, or debt held by the public, uh, th this, this chart would come down maybe 20 or 25 percent, but it would basically shadow shadow those lines. So, so the, the point is that uh, that we've got uh, real problems here. Now, as Alice said, what's sustainable, and of course, what's sustainable has to do with what else you want to spend your money on. Uh, uh, so, so our focus on uh, the debt uh, is a shorthand for uh, the other functions of government that we want to finance. Uh, not just wars, but domestic uh, policy and so on. Uh, now, um, uh, you know, here's, here's the classic uh, entitlement uh, chart, uh, thanks to uh, CBO and, and Paul Ginsburg. Uh, and um, so uh, what this shows very simply uh, is that uh, uh, we have to do something about Medicare. Uh, the long-term projection for Medicare is uh, constantly uh, rising spending, uh, whereas with Social Security, uh, it tapers off after about 2035. Uh, related to the structure of benefits in Social Security, related to the uh, fact, uh, related to the demographic trends. With Medicare, the, I think, reasonable assumption based on the past uh, is that there may be some lessening of the growth, but it's not going to it's not going to flatten out. Uh, uh, you'll you'll also note uh, the effect of uh, health reform, uh, which uh, is almost imperceptible uh, compared to uh, Medicare. So that's why we focus on Medicare. Uh, now, uh, okay, well. I'll tear them. I had to use your. I had to use your uh, chart. <clears throat> I'll have to ask you how you got this. But, but uh, uh, whether you whether you particularly believe this shape or not, it's certainly true that healthcare has been ratcheting up. Uh, and uh, maybe Charlie can uh, ex explain this to me uh, sometime later and to the rest of us. Uh, but healthcare is ratcheting up. A and uh, the interesting question is, where is Medicare in all of this? Well, uh, so I did a little calculation looking at national health expenditures, and, and the disturbing thing is uh, 
that uh, even in periods of time when health spending has grown relatively slowly, Medicare has exceeded the growth in national health spending. Uh, uh, now, you look at 2000 to 2010 and you might say, well, gee, uh, doesn't that, uh, isn't, that the, isn't that Part D, we added a benefit, doesn't that, it, doesn't that explain it? And the answer is no. 2007 to 2010, Medicare grew 65% faster than national health spending. By the way, that's total national health spending. It has Medicare in there. So if you compared it, which I didn't, uh, to uh, national health spending, less Medicare, the comparison is, is even worse. Uh, this is the reason why we, we tend to focus on Medicare. This is the reason we should focus on Medicare. Uh, and um, uh, the fact is that uh, although we do get a respite, uh, as uh, Alice said, uh, younger baby boomers will be, uh, have started to join Medicare and for a few years, uh, trends flatten out. Uh, but, uh, you know, the good news is that the health sector has been very, very successful. So those younger baby boomers will make it to become older baby boomers. And uh, we've got all sorts of things we can do for them, and I mean us, and I mean me. Uh, so um, uh, we, we, we have a short respite. Uh, now, uh, um, this is uh, from uh, the most recent CBO baseline, looking at uh, how uh, health care Health spending, federal health spending, will crowd out uh, other federal spending, at least in the baseline. And, and what this shows, uh, I think very disturbingly, is that if you just uh, look at the share of the budget uh, that is accounted for by uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and other health spending, and that, in that includes the subsidies in the health insurance exchanges, uh, that share rises uh, from 24% uh, in 2012 to about 35% in 2022, according to uh, current, uh, uh, current law. Now, that assumes uh, gigantic cuts in physician payment. That assumes that uh, the IPAB works and it holds uh, spending in Medicare to uh, GDP plus 1%. That assumes a lot of good things that could happen. So this is, uh, this I think is a fairly optimistic uh, viewpoint. But you can see discretionary spending, uh, which, uh, you know, think of it as roads, think of it as, as uh, uh, to some extent, housing, uh, energy uh, policy, education, uh, defense. Think of all the things you're interested in. That's what discretionary spending is. That's what the concern is all about. That's why that first graph is uh, so disturbing. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so now, uh, the bad news is, as I said, this is optimistic, but it's optimistic in a, in a, in a couple of ways, and I want to illustrate that with uh, some charts from uh, the uh, CMS Actuary's office. Uh, and what they show is that under current law, uh, hospital uh, payments, ho ho the payment rates, uh, will uh, coincide with Medicaid and stay there. And the assumption is that Medicaid payment rates that's, that's price, that's not price times quantity. Medicaid payments rates will continue to decline uh, over the next uh, 75 years. Uh, whether you want to believe that or not is, is up to you, but that surely isn't a good sign. And these are relative to uh, private health sector spending uh, or payment rates. So if there is a downward a trend as I, I'm not sure what, what the actuaries assume, but I, but I suspect that they assumed a certain amount of downward trend there. That means that this is actually a grimmer picture than it looks. And then, you know, is this optimistic? No, this, this shows the gigantic reduction, about 27.5% reduction in uh, uh, payment rates to physicians. And then even more disturbing what it shows is that uh, uh, physician uh, payment uh, would actually drop below Medicaid. And now why is that? That's because there's a law that for institutional providers that says that uh, uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, can't, they, you know, Medicaid can't drop, or I guess Medicare can't drop below Medicaid. I think that's the way it works. Somebody can correct me later if I've got it wrong. One of them can't drop below the other. So when they hit, then they have to stay on the same pattern. Whereas with doctors, well, they didn't have as much institutional clout. So Medicare can pay lower. Do you believe it? I don't. Uh, and we have the last eight years to demonstrate that that's not very likely. Uh, okay, so uh, then uh, where do we go from here? Um, the uh, debt ceiling. Um, 
uh, uh, you know, the good old days, <clears throat> they were just last year, uh, when the Budget Control Act was creating the super committee and the super committee was gonna solve all our problems. The only problem is that they foolishly selected members of Congress to serve on the committee. I think if any of you were on the committee, it would have been, well, probably not okay. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the super committee grabbed the kryptonite and uh, you know, succumbed uh, to the floor. Uh, and so here we are with a sequester coming up, the first uh, uh, sequester in Medicare uh, hitting uh, uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, the sequester is, uh, for Medicare is 2%. Uh, the point of this chart is to say that that is a ludic ludicrously small reduction uh, in uh, Medicare uh, spending. It's well below what we would normally expect Congress to enact in a normal year. Uh, now, whether they would actually enforce it's another matter. But enactment, you know, you want a good CBO score, that's the way to go. And in fact, the White House proposal last September uh, uh, illustrates this, and they repeated this. I don't think the numbers are exactly the same, but they repeated this in the, in the February uh, uh, 2013 uh, uh, budget. Uh, uh, much larger reduction in Medicare over the next 10 years, uh, some reduction in Medicaid, uh, uh, whereas uh, the uh, Budget Control Act uh, didn't touch Medicaid. Now, everybody talks about the unsustainable cuts in Medicare. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Actuary's Office has pointed out uh, that uh, hospitals and other institutional providers in Part A, that 15% of them would be losing money on their Medicare business by 2019. They haven't changed that estimate, by the way. Uh, Rick Foster, the chief actuary, has called that unsustainable. Okay, well, unsustainable cuts are just the beginning. Uh, that is to say, if we continue in the same path that we've been in all along. Uh, now, the Affordable Care Act, unfortunately, uh, didn't really address the cost issue. It focused on coverage, an important issue. It did not address cost. I think, uh, in fact, it probably uh, took the uh, uh, model of uh, Massachusetts, where they also uh, uh, focused on coverage and uh, pretty much admitted that they would think about cost later on when it began to hit. Now it's beginning to hit. Uh, so so you, you look at the policies, uh, it would be great if they worked, but the fact is that accountable care organizations are HMO light. Uh, I'm concerned uh, that if uh, beneficiaries don't know that they are in an organized health plan, uh, that the health plan won't be organized, uh, and they will act like they always act, uh, and they will seek out uh, uh, expensive providers because they're not paying any direct uh, costs, uh, most of them. Uh, bundled payments. Bundled payments are a fundamentally good idea. We've been talking about this for, uh, let's see, I think I joined uh, HICFA in 85. So at least since 85 that I can remember, uh, we're still talking about them. Great idea. Uh, uh, however, uh, this only slightly modifies the fundamental incentives and in fee-for-service. You're packaging things up, but it's still fee-for-service. Uh, we should need to do that, but uh, you need to go, I think, beyond that. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, the big cuts uh, to providers in traditional Medicare, including the sustainable growth rate, the physician cut, which wasn't addressed in the law and hasn't really been addressed seriously in terms of policy as opposed to givebacks uh, since uh, 1977, I think it is. Um, uh, so, so these are issues that really are just hanging out there waiting to be dealt with. Uh, the IPAB, the concern I have with that is that it, is, it has a very short-term focus. It's supposed to uh, uh, identify when spending is rising too rapidly, ideally, the preceding year. It's supposed to propose policies, primarily cutting payment rates, nothing else, that will very quickly solve that problem. They could go beyond that, but they're going to have a hard enough time coming up with uh, price control policies. So I, I, IPAB is really not the answer. It really is the old policies that we've had all along. It doesn't change the way uh, we deliver health care. Uh, and then uh, the whole bottom line here is that uh, we have yet, either in the Affordable Care Act or in any other legislation, really think about the long-term impact in legislative terms as opposed to in important conferences like this one, uh, the long-term impact of Medicare spending on future generations. So. What do we need to do? Structural changes are, are required. Uh, 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 I would argue for putting uh, federal health spending uh, on uh, an enforceable budget. Yes, it's in the budget. Uh, no, it isn't enforceable. Uh, no, there's no uh, stop. There's no 
automatic uh, uh, stopping place in the budget for uh, entitlement spending. Uh, that's true for Social Security, but the formulas work somewhat in our favor. Uh, in, in health programs, on the other hand, uh, it's a real entitlement. Uh, if, uh, if a Medicare beneficiary uh, goes out and gets services, uh, then by and large they'll be paid for. Uh, the the fee-for-service uh, incentives, which uh, drive 75% of the program, uh, uh, also uh, drive uh, utilization in a big, big way. Uh, uh, lowering payment rates helps until you realize, well, wait a minute, we actually haven't changed the incentives. And so as long as there's a margin somewhere, not necessarily with that service where the payment rates have been cut, uh, then uh, you expect and you see the health sector moving in those directions. So we have to take a look at a broader payment package, and that's where uh, moving to a defined benefit approach uh, in Medicare, it's called premium support, but the, the principle is, is pretty clear. Instead of saying we'll pay for essentially anything, just send us the bill, and then we'll take a discount off, but, you know, of course, your charges are much higher than your real costs. Nobody knows what the costs are. One of the definitions of cost in healthcare, by the way, is if somebody pays for it, it's automatically a cost. Uh, so uh, Medicare premium support, uh, uh, we need to move from rewarding volume and intensity of service to rewarding, not penalizing, efficiency and cost effectiveness. And the fact is that although we talk about cost effectiveness, in efficiency, we reward quantity, which is pretty much the opposite thing. Of course, we have to do a lot of other things. Uh, people who talk uh, about uh, premium support oftentimes uh, ignore the fact that it is not a simple policy. You have to do a lot of things. It does not eliminate and it should not eliminate regulation. Uh, you need regulation, you just need sensible regulation. You're gonna need to refine this year after year after year as what you didn't expect happens, which always happens in health policy. You need better information for consumers. You need better information for providers. <clears throat> uh, you need to encourage, uh, especially in fee-for-service fee Medicare, you need to uh, uh, encourage greater coordination. We've been talking about this term uh, for, uh, I think Gail Walensky picked on coordinated care because she didn't like the term managed care, and that would have been in 1987 or 88, something like that. Okay, well, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. We've been talking about it a long time. It hasn't happened in the Medicare program. Uh, um, and now we have the computer systems to possibly uh, make that a reality. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other things we should do. Fee-for-service Medicare is gonna be with us, I think, forever. And if that's the case, that's a program that has to be given the tools that make it uh, a, a, competitive, uh, uh, a competitor in a competitive market. Um, uh, I would argue that fee for service Medicare should not be run exclusively out of Capitol Hill and out of Baltimore. I would argue that uh, fee for service Medicare ignores the regional variations and the regional issues, and it can't deal with them very well, precisely because it is a, quote, national program. It's not a national program. We should admit it, and we should allow it to operate on a more competitive basis. Uh, you know, simplifying cross-sharing, adding catastrophic coverage, uh, there are a whole bunch of other things uh, that we could do, discouraging uh, first dollar Medigap coverage, raising the eligibility age. Uh, Alice and I have been talking about these things for a long time. One of these days, uh, Congress will enact them. Uh, uh, Medicaid, uh, I, I, put in, I put in a block grant. Uh, do I really mean a block grant? I mean something that puts a budget on on Medicaid spending, uh, but gives states a better incentive than we now have in that program. Uh, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> clever accounting in Medicaid. Uh, I live in Maryland, and unfortunately, I help preside over uh, Maryland's uh, succumbing to uh, the uh, uh, implementation of a taxes scheme on providers because we ran into Medicaid funding problems, and Medicaid is an all-payer state for hospitals. So we've been beaten into the ground. Our, our policy up until three years ago was, hell no, we'd never do that. Uh, so if, if Maryland, with its regulatory apparatus, has been sucked into this, think about all the other states, uh, we need to do something about that. 
And then the tax exclusion, uh, moving to refundable tax credits, uh, maybe advanceable refundable tax credits, shifting the locus of subsidy to the people who actually need it, and frankly, none of us do. Okay, why don't we get, a, you know, 10% of what we're now getting? Why not? That's a good political solution. But most of that money should be going to low-income people who uh, would like to buy insurance and are having difficulty doing that. Anyway, there's lots to be done, and uh, I guess we look forward to your questions. Thank you, Joe. Why don't I just take one minute to see if somebody would like to come up to the mic and ask a question, and maybe while hopefully a brave soul is doing that. Joe, I'm just curious, on your structural change list, your first item was an enforceable federal health care budget. So does that mean you don't think the sequester is enforceable? Well, the problem with the, the, problem with the sequester is that uh, there will be a new Congress starting in January, and they didn't pass it. Uh, so, yeah, the sequester is sort of enforceable. But what I, what I really had in mind is something that uh, Alice and I and a, and a group of uh, uh, people who are concerned about uh, fiscal policy have, have suggested uh, uh, actually for some time now. The idea of, of having, uh, in essence, a national debate uh, about uh, how much we want to devote to health spending and other entitlements versus everything else, and, and allowing the, having it be an explicit debate uh, and allowing it to change, but, but making it conscious rather than unconscious, which is what we're doing now. Great. Yes. Uh, Bob Berenson, Urban Institute. Both of you dealt with, I think, half of the issue, which is the spending side. Uh, CBO projects that half of the Medicare spending increase over the next 25 years is from a near doubling of the population served. So where are the revenues? How do you solve what's essentially a lack of revenues by spending cuts where we have spending under reasonable control? Well, I would say to that, first, I don't think we have re spending under reasonable control. But uh, I stressed at the beginning, uh, and may maybe should have stressed more, uh, that any sensible plan uh, for uh, stabilizing the debt uh, requires uh, substantially more revenues. Uh, now, there are different ways of getting that, uh, and uh, the pro but the proposals in Simpson-Bowles and Domenici Rivlin are uh, a total blow up of the uh, individual and uh, corporate uh, tax codes uh, and uh, reform that uh, gives you uh, lower rates, a much broader base, and a lot more revenue. But nothing uh, specific in med to Medicare revenue? I mean, sort of general. Oh, Medicare tax revenue? Uh, uh, no. I mean, I think we've we've done it on Medicare revenue. Uh, we uh, did. Uh, we took the cap off completely uh, on uh, the Medicare uh, tax. Uh, one, uh, as as long as you do keep Medicare in its present form and and the different parts, uh, I'd raise the Part B premium uh, and uh, to get it back up toward its original. Uh, uh, relationship to the total cost. It's fallen to about 25%. Uh, we proposed in Domenici Rivlin going to 35%, uh, but um, that's not a really uh, big deal. The big deal on revenues is uh, for a form of the income tax or something else you could do. You could go for a consumption tax, uh, whatever, but you're going to need several uh, several trillion over 10 years, uh, and, and uh, Medicare is de minimis. Yeah, I, I completely agree with uh, Alice's uh, points. Uh, uh, one thing that I would do, though, is if we were serious about uh, making Medicare a more modern insurance program, you would, you would erase the distinctions between A and B. Uh, and, and then, I think, a premium. We, we, we need to get away from 1965, because we're not there anymore. So, so it's legitimate to have a premium for real insurance. And if we have a real insurance program, then you have a broader base. And uh, you know, you'd also change the cost sharing and so on. But I think the premium needs to apply to the whole benefit and not just part of it for uh, irrelevant historical reasons. Ultimately, you would put C and D in the same package. Ab absolutely. Hi, Let's take uh, one more quick uh, one. Judy Lave from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, we've talked a lot here about structural changes, and we've talked about that for a long time. 
But I'm somewhat concerned about whether or not we ought not to be talking about cultural changes and that we ought to have a debate uh, that talks about that. We talk about that. I think about things like our current debate about cost effectiveness analyses. Uh, whereby people went out the window when they decided they didn't want to pay for things that weren't showing to be effective. Uh, HMS, CMS has refused to decrease spending for a back surgery, which is proven to be ineffective. So I think that there is a other debate that has to take place. I mean, we spend billions of dollars on what some people consider to be of no value, uh, the people who get it, I think, believe that there is some value. So I, I, panelists I think that debate on comparative is really effectiveness research. And of course, PCORI is going to start pumping out $500 million in grants a year on this very topic. I think we have to do cost effectiveness research and we have to restructure payments so that they don't reward ineffective, demonstrably ineffective treatments. If you want an ineffective treatment, you're going to have to pay for it. Uh, but uh, I think you do that gradually. I can't imagine that we have a national debate uh, about this subject that uh, is constructive and, and suddenly decide the good guys won and from now on we're changing culture. Culture doesn't work that way. It changes slowly uh, and uh, gradually over time. Uh, uh, absolutely. Alice and I agree about nearly everything. Um, <clears throat> the, other, uh, the other problem is that if there was ever a program uh, that could not take the lead. It is the Medicare program. Let's not talk about Medicaid. Medicaid's kind of in its own box. But the Medicare program can't do it. Uh, it's, it's completely clear that the political, the political threat of a, you know, a government entity saying you can't have this is too much for politicians to absorb. So uh, what we actually need uh, is for uh, uh, you know, subsidies and, and other work uh, done to uh, tr try to ascertain to the very limited extent possible what doesn't work. Uh, the problem is that, of course, the information changes on a pretty regular basis, but let's try that. But what we really need uh, to have happen is for uh, private insurance companies outside the Medicare program to uh, accept the harsh economic and financial realities that they have to take the lead, and they will. And even more so if the economy continues to remain in the doldrums, which some people are, uh, uh, are predicting for some time to come. Uh, I, I, private, private plans can do this because you can always change private plans. But the government, uh, that has a very negative political consequences. So, Joe, just on that point, do you anticipate that the government will end up following the private sector on comparative effectiveness and even maybe using the private sector at, for the political cover? Uh, well, I think, I think inevitably when practice changes, Medicare quits paying for it. They don't, you don't necessarily have to have a policy. You just have to have doctors to stop prescribing things that, that don't help. So, so there's, there are a lot of things, or stop or at least reduce. I see Gene shaking his head, so he's very optimistic about that, I'm sure. Uh, so am I, quite honestly. Uh, but but uh, I think it's very difficult, at least under current political circumstances, uh, to uh, see the government issuing an edict about coverage. Uh, payment, I think, is, is much easier to deal with because nobody understands it. Uh, uh, no. You know, beneficiary understands it, and most beneficiaries think that it's covered anyway because they have Medigap or, or Medicaid or something else that, that fills in the gap. Uh, I think one of the things that's going to change, though, is that increasingly the gap isn't going to be filled in, and to the extent that, that Medicare patients have to pay, they're going to be a lot more interested in asking these questions. I want to thank Alice and Joe, who, despite our best efforts, continue to agree more than disagree. So uh, that should tell us something. Thank you both very much. I think we're going to do a quick, um, if we can call up our second panel. Um, Upton will flip a couple of name tags up here. I'll just let you know who's who's joining us for this next topic, which is Overall health spending, what path are we on? And I believe we're going to begin.
with Len Nichols, who is presently a professor at George Mason University, um, then followed by Arnie Milstein, who now is out at Stanford School of Medicine, and then followed by Zayad Haidar uh, from Ascension, who I am hoping that you can help us with a little bit of a real world perspective for all of us that get stuck in the beltway too much. Uh, so Len, here or standing, whatever you're most comfortable. So um, thank you, CC. It's a privilege to be here. And um, I must say, though, I, I like the introduction uh, as if Ziad's in the real world and me and Arnie aren't. But anyhow, we'll note I, I, I work outside the Beltway now. So there, Mason's on the other side. Speechifying. Um, I do come inside from time to time, it is true. So what path are we actually on? Well, I want to talk about where we're headed where everyone wants us to be, even Joe and Alice who agree on everything, choices and challenges, and then what the real world is, in my view, managing uncertain progress. So where are we now? I thought this title, Through a Glass Darkly, sort of kept ringing in my ears, and I found this actually photograph on the web, but I really like the Bergman movie image of it better. And she's saying, there are wild beasts everywhere in the silent darkness of the Through a Glass. I think, I didn't know Bergman was smart enough to anticipate House Republicans. I'm very impressed that he figured out what wild beasts are. And they are there to get us if we're not careful in the darkness. So here's the problem. We've all been through it. But I don't think people have said it in exactly this way. It has to do with health care costs and premiums growing faster than income. That's what this is all about, in my opinion. It has to do with the fact that more and more humans can't afford what all of us think they ought to have. And premiums are growing faster, out-of-pocket premiums are growing even faster than total premium, and of course median income is growing in negative ways the last 10 years. And, and interestingly, premiums have grown faster than health care costs for a decade, which is kind of an interesting little fact about market power and its relative forms. Now, we've been through this a lot. I'm not going to belabor the point. I'll just apologize for the complexity of this graph because it does come from CBO and after Al Gore was in power, they have to put two ideas in every paper, in every picture to say, paper, it's a pain in the ass. But anyway, the point is, we did start, the, the line is share of GDP debt held by the public, uh, it, and it's read on the right-hand scale, and it starts around 40%, and as Alice said, it's now above 60, headed towards 70. And uh, the left-hand scale is the interest on the debt, and what I think this does usefully is convey that in the period where we are, that is to say with the recession and the stimulus attempt, by the way, the stimulus is about a third of that, uh, we've had this stair-step increase in debt in interest. Note we've gone from about 1% of GDP on interest to 3% of GDP on interest. And I would point out to cover all the uninsured takes 1% of GDP. The Affordable Care Act spends three quarters of 1% of GDP and covers about three quarters of uninsured. It's kind of funny how that works. And so my point is we are squandering two times as much as is required to cover the uninsured because we can't figure out a bipartisan way to get our fiscal house in order. And in my view, that's a moral failing of a very high order. So, but I do want to give you my version of history because while uh, Joe and Alice talked about it. I don't think they hit all the highlights. And what this is, is the publicly held debt as a percentage of GDP. And as Alice said, we were above 100% after World War II. And notice it did come down. And it did come down mostly because of economic growth. But it's important to understand what was going on then. We were actually investing in infrastructure. We were actually investing in a scientific apparatus to make our universities the envy of the world. We were investing in roads and schools and bridges and so forth. And we were still showing a decline. Why? Because we had a bipartisan agreement that we basically should pay for what we do. And that continued. We went from over 100% to about 20%, and then we had a pretty big hiccup, although all the, all the scallops are hiccups, of course, that come with recessions. But it really started going up with Reagan. So let's just be clear, okay? We were at 20% of GDP, and then Ronald Reagan told us we don't have to pay for government. And he cut taxes. And he whooped the commies, and we tore down the wall, and we did all that great stuff. But he told us we don't have to pay for government. And that led to Ross Perot. Now, I personally love Ross Perot, because he's the only American who has bigger ears than I do. I really like that. 
But he also had that wonderful twang. He has no accent at all, of course. And he, said, he, bought, he bought TV time with his own money, held up little PowerPoints, and he said, we've got to get serious about the debt. He created the political space for Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, who didn't like each other very much and still don't and never will, and didn't agree on almost anything and never will. But they managed, I think Alice might have been B, C, uh, OMB at the time, they managed to balance the budget. And suddenly we turned back down. And then what happened? The Bush tax cuts. So let's just be clear. Tax cuts are a major part of how we got in this mess. And by the way, the recent economic excitement, let me remind you, you know, that is about the almost depression and the stimulus to stop the almost depression. The problem is not that we borrow when we have to. We did that in World War II. When you have to, when you face an existential threat, you have to borrow to spend. The problem is the absence of bipartisan agreement about what to do now, about how you get it down, how you bring it down back into the balanced range. And that's where it takes both sides to actually be intellectually honest, as Joe and Alice were. I wish they were in the Congress. Okay. So here's the health care piece. We've all seen this a bunch of times, but let me just remind you what the Ryan budget really does. It really cuts the share of federal spending out of GDP that will go to health care in 20 years. It cuts it by half. Yeah. That would be what I would call pretty serious shock therapy for a health care system that is nowhere near ready for this kind of draconian move. And I just give you an image. Have you been to an understaffed nursing home in the summertime? So let me also remind you, we are talking about these cuts at a time when our economy is still in great peril. We are teetering on the edge of a double-dip recession. And all we're talking about is how much to cut. Now, this is not some left-wing plot. This comes from Goldman Sachs. Rumor has it they're pretty good at capitalism. And they have a model that actually depicts the impact of federal and state spending, net fiscal impact, on the economy. And it shows in the early part of the Obama administration, when the stimulus was serious, it was increasing GDP by 2%. Over time, as the Fed spending dropped, and the state spending really dropped off once the Fed subsidy of state spending ended, then the net fiscal impact was negative. But that dotted line over there at the end, that would be the fiscal cliff we face. So if all we do is let these sequester things go into effect in the name of a down payment, as Joe would put it, toward solving the long-term debt problem, we're going to drive our economy back. That's a negative 3% hit. We have a term for that in economics. It's called a big screw-up. You do not want to have a negative 3% drag on an economy that's already weak. So the idea that we are not talking about simultaneously affecting macroeconomic stimulus along with long-term debt, I just find that bizarre. So I have to ask this question, are we really overtaxed? You know, Bob raised the point, and I think it's just unambiguously true, what is missing in our national discussion of all these issues is what is the proper tax rate? And I show you here the vertical axis is um, GDP growth. Okay, and the horizontal axis is the total take from both, in our case, state and, and federal, from the uh, economy. And what I'm trying to say here is the USA tax rate is 10 percentage points less as a share of GDP than the OECD average. And we have a bigger military than all of them combined. So tell me we're doing too much redistribution. Tell me we are doing too much discretionary spending. Tell me we are not in some kind of imbalance. And note the German and Austrian growth rates are way above ours in the most difficult economic times we've all been through, and they have tax rates above OECD averages. So it's not about tax rates. It's about how you do it. And what I'm trying to say is we need to be far more balanced about how we deal with this because we think we know what we want, but we don't think, I don't think anybody who understands the healthcare system believes the Ryan budget trajectory is feasible. It's just not. So we have got to figure out another way. We think we know what we want. We think we want this condition-specific, patient acuity-adjusted, comprehensive payment. I agree with Joe completely. Get away from 8,000 CPT codes. Get away from 500 DRGs. And if we get the right bundle, then, of course, we'll have the perfect distribution. Everybody will be happy. Win, win, win. We can imagine a catnip-filled nirvana. The problem, of course, for those of you who remember Star Trek, there really ain't no Scotty. 
we really got to go from where we are. And it's not going to be smooth sailing. And just so you can see that up close, that guy in the front, for those of you who have not done psychiatric residencies lately, his mouth is wide open. That would be abject terror. <laughs> and the guy in the back has pretty much reached a catatonic state. <laughs> and if you look closely, you will see the raft is actually backwards. <laughs> Which means, of course, they've already fallen out and climbed in any old way they could. But what I really want you to notice is all four paddles are out of the water. And for those of you who don't white water, you know that means either they're now going exactly the way they want to go or they don't have a clue about what to do next. <laughs> I submit to you, and Ziad will confirm this, I believe, every human being who is in the healthcare system today feels like they're in this raft. And all we policy wonks can tell them is, well, we're not sure, but we think if you paddle that way, it'll be good. I mean, come on. They, and they can't take six months off and figure this out. They have to do it with patients coming every single second of every single day. And we are asking them for a fundamental, it's like a moonshot. It's huge change in sentence. And I'm totally for it, but it's going to take a little while. So we basically have two roads here to fiscal balance. One is just say we can't afford it. Just cap, cap it. Medicaid was a nice idea. Two expensive, put a block grant on it. Medicare was a nice idea, too expensive, so we'll fix the voucher, have it grow at GDP, and just say that's all we can afford. We could do that. I submit to you the healthcare system wouldn't respond all that well, but nevertheless. Or we could realign incentives, and it may seem that realigning incentives takes the wisdom of Pericles. And we don't have Pericles. We have Rick Gilfillan and Barack Obama. Uh, they're distinctly not Pericles, okay? I agree. There's a hell of a lot that's going to have to be done that they can't do. So we face these big choices, though. And what scares me about the nature of the budget health care conversation in this city when I do come inside the Beltway, what scares me is how much of it is spreadsheet economics. Pick a number. That's the number at which we'll fix the growth rate for Medicaid and Medicare and let them figure it out. Well, you know what? They can't. If insurers could do this, I'm going to tell you a secret, they would have. They can't because they don't have the market power to deal with the reality on the ground in most parts of our country. So the idea that we're going to withdraw the government and just have health plans go forth and enforce the discipline Joe would like to enforce, show me the health plan that has that kind of market power. I will be happy to observe. What I hear them talk about is how little market power they have vis-a-vis -vis the hospital and physician nexus that's pushing back on them. So I don't see how you can rely on them as a deus ex machina. I think we're stuck with a long, hard slog through incentive realignment and delivery plus health production reform. We've got to get mutual accountable risk and reward and something like targets and some creature like an iPad, Lord knows I'd give it more broad-ranging powers, but you got to have that kind of thing or you're never going to get where you want to be. And let me remind you, incentive realignment is multidimensional. We spend all our time talking about employer, payer versus provider because that's exciting and it's where all the money is, and it's where all the kind of gerbil fixing is going on, make the maze run, make them run this way through the maze. But in fact, if we don't engage the patient, I know we, hear, we say this a lot, but it's really true. If we don't engage the patient, both in terms of cost sharing through the, through the wellness, smart benefit design, as well as decision support, they have to have tools to enable them to help make decisions with the clinicians, properly incentivize physicians, properly incentivize patients, I am confident we'll get there. But to do that is going to take some work. And remember, patients don't live in the healthcare system. Patients live in communities. And communities don't all have healthy food, and they don't all have places to exercise and so forth. So the challenges are no one knows exactly how to do this. No one. And that our politics are broken. I probably don't have to remind you this, but I'll just point out, I love this picture. A, she's smiling. B, it's in front of the Airlines Arena in Dallas where the Mavericks play. And I, I was for the Mavericks last year, a bunch of old guys playing basketball. I like that idea somehow. <laughs> I resonate. But what I'm also sure of is that she didn't read 2,000 pages and conclude that indeed the Affordable Care Act is what they taught her at SMU is socialism. I'm pretty sure somebody gave her that sign. And I'm pretty sure that when you think about it, socialism is government takeover. Government takeover is not 2,000 pages. Government takeover is two lines. You're all in Medicare, starts in July. Okay, so what is this about? It is about our broken politics. And here's a great juxtaposition. The sign behind it, protect my health care, protect the law. This woman is convinced 
that the supporters of the law are trying to stifle her voice, and that's why she put the red blood paint on her face, because she's convinced that this law is absolute tyranny. I submit to you, this is not what I'd call a reasoned debate. Okay, so the core of opposition is really about fear. And I don't know how government became the vampire, but I'm pretty sure he's going to stay the vampire unless somebody figures out how to talk about what government is for and how to talk about what taxes are for and how to talk about the fact that we are undertaxed compared to our ambitions. And there's fear of economics. There's no question all bad behavior is based on fear, and there's no question the recession is huge in people's minds. And there's no question. But how do you fear going back to starvation over arguing in the health care law about 1% of GDP? How do you do that? You have to have a lot of help. And finally, we fear losing access to our own care. This, by the way, is a waiting room from Toronto, just so we can get the Canadian weight in the picture here. But the point is, look, average American has six visits a year. We outnumber the uninsured six to one. They already get health care. You know this. They get about half, 50, 60 percent of what we get. One view, fewer visit for each of us, we take care of this, that problem. And how many docs would prefer to deal with you not having to look at you in the face anyway? They'd rather do email, but they don't get paid for that. So we've got to figure out how to make incentive structures work. This is not rocket science. Here's the menu of things CMMI is doing. I wish them well. Truth in advertising, I'm an innovation advisor, which is proof how desperate they are. But nevertheless, uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of good ideas. But here's the best part of that. What the private, just like Joe said, what the private sector is doing in response to the reality that we're going to have to change incentives. What this is is a map from Karen Ignani at AHIP shows all the different medical home, bundling, ACO, same kind of things the ACA created. But these are being created in the private sector faster and spreading faster. Every state is involved in this, except for Wyoming, and we know in Wyoming there are only 19 people. They're all healthy, so who cares? So anyway, the point is, the whole country is behind this incentive realignment effort. 3,000 applications for the Innovation Challenge Grant. 3,000 different healthcare organizations trying to say, this is how I would like to realign incentives. So what are we really talking about? We're talking about cutting spending, and there really are only four ways to do it. We could all eat our broccoli and do more sit-ups. Good luck with that in the short run. That's why we focus so much on lower use, to some degree lower prices. And we would prefer to get there through higher quality, but we know that's going to take a while too. In some cases, quality can lower costs. In some cases, quality will not. So what are the targets? Well, you know, most of this is about use. Unnecessary services from the IOM and, and David Cutler. Uh, unnecessary services, but also let me remind you, excessive administrative costs. Hospitals spend 20 cents on the dollar getting paid. Doctor's offices under 10, 30 cents on the dollar. Why? Because there are 1,300 members of AHIP, all of whom have different claims adjudication algorithms, which is a long way of saying it takes 30 cents on the dollar to get paid. We could fix that in a couple of years. So anyway, there's a lot of ways we can reduce costs. I would say this conveys the scale. And this is why we should be sober about all this. Okay, we're talking about moving from 100 to 70, whatever metric you want to apply to that conversion factor. I don't think you're going to reduce nursing home and home health in total, given our demographics. Drugs, we probably could beat a lot out of prices if we try harder. Um, I presumed we would move total physician spending not up or down, but around. Way more on primary care teams, way less on specialists. But most of the money, there's no way out of this, has got to come out of hospitals. There's no other way to pull this off which is why the odds on the panel. We gotta figure out a way to help them make a living while the transition occurs. That's really the path we gotta do. There are two ways to get to 30% of spend out. One is for everybody to do a little bit, which ain't gonna happen. The other is for shining cities on a hill to exist and teach the rest of us. That's the way it's always happened, and thank God Ascension is one of those cities, and we're happy they're here. So what do we need? In my opinion, we need a commitment to build a system that works for all of us. That's how you make it sustainable. You can't solve the problem unless you agree what the problem is. The problem in Congress is they wouldn't agree what the problem was. Right? Until they do, we're not going to solve it. So we need data from the government. We need the data to help us build a collaborative infrastructure so the shining cities can teach each other. And we need the government to be part of a smart buyer team that includes the private sector. There is way, way much to do 
on lots of fronts and removing the government as a buyer, since it's the single biggest one and the only one with market power to deal with real hospital power around the country, removing that from the equation is suicide. But it can't do it all, as Joe said. You gotta have, a, and I would say governments have to partner with the willing and bribe the rest. Right? Because there are a lot of physician leaders, Ziad is one of them, who are trying to take us to the promised land, but they need the government to help them and not hurt them, and maybe you'll hear a little bit about that. And for some, we just buy them off. We've got to recognize there's mutual self-interest in pulling this off, and that we can't just protect the fiscal purse without shifting an unconscionable amount of risk to everybody else. That's my fundamental point. We also need mechanisms for spread within organizations, culture, and leadership. But the more important thing is how you do it across organizations, and that's why you really need a mechanism for collaboration. In my opinion, the most promising things are multi-payer payment reform initiatives that are going on in different parts of the country. Because what clinicians really want is one set of incentives, one set of reporting requirements, one set of feedback loops. What they don't want are 1,300 different ones. Okay, and across payers. The good news is the Affordable Care Act changes these incentives. It fundamentally outlaws risk selection. That's the point. That's why 800 of the 1,300 from ADF hate it. And they will go away if this law survives. They will sell their books to the big guys. That's okay. How many can you name? Yeah, that's the point. You don't need them. <laughs> They're a little bitty. You don't want to meet them, trust me. But the point is, those guys, the business model will become helping clients find value in the healthcare system, not profiting by protecting the healthy from the sick. That is the point. And then there'll be a powerful incentive to share. And then finally, across communities. Again, Shining City on the Hill. Those communities that figure it out will get the jobs. That ain't rocket science either. Jobs are gonna go where healthcare costs are lower. Okay, I'll stop. Wonderful, Len, thank you. Why don't we go straight to Arnie, and then after uh, Ziad, we can also open it up for a couple of questions. Arnie Milstein, thank you. Thanks, Cece. The, um, this is the, uh, the job that we've collectively gathered to, uh, to discuss. How do, we, how do we get it done? Uh, obviously, you know, per a point that uh, Joe Newhouse has made uh, very, very articulately, the challenge is not simply uh, reducing per capita spending in the U.S., but every year uh, reducing it uh, uh, by a little bit, uh, much as the auto companies, uh, as they begin to re-engineer their engines, every year come up with, on average, uh, about a 2 to 3 percent gain in fuel efficiency uh, that, uh, that, that didn't exist before we began to uh, create substantial uh, pressures uh, on them uh, to do so. Uh, this is, you know, I'm obviously not a dentist, but this is my, you know, portrayal of this uh, first derivative problem. That's the first derivative of spending we're after, uh, in not necessarily the absolute level, although there are plenty of opportunities to reduce the absolute level. Uh, and, and I, for, for 2012, to credit, I, I borrowed the uh, Alterm Institute uh, projection. But as you can see, there, you know, the, there are good years and bad years. The upper gum line is the rate of growth in uh, per capita health spending, the, the blue line, the, the bottom gum line, is, the, is our ability to pay for it. It's across not just uh, government, but also private sector. Uh, the problem with not doing anything about private sector Medicare, um, private sector spending, is, uh, is what, you quickly, what I quickly saw as a MedPAC commissioner about nine months into that experience, which is that if, you, if, uh, if, if hospitals and doctors can come in and demonstrate, or all, all categories of providers, that you know that, uh, that that they're losing tons of money, you know, on Medicare. Uh, then then it, that becomes leverage on Medicare uh, to uh, to increase rates. So you got it has to be you have to do something about both private and public sector spending, and you know, there's a lot of debate now as to whether we should you know attach a lot of a lot of a, a lot of uh, uh, belief in in the fact that we may have crushed long-term trend, and you know I. I'm, I'm on the side of not being not being very sure of it. It depends when you set the best baseline for calculating your change, and uh, and for those of you who remember Drew, uh, uh, Drew Altman's famous two-page article in Health Affairs, any time the health industry has gotten in the crosshairs of uh, of public policy, the behavior gets better and trend levels off for a while, separate and apart from the from the impact of the declining economy. So I, I think it's you know I think we we still have a problem, and there are a lot of 
A lot of people uh, who are getting, you know, munched up, uh, you know, as a consequence of our, our so far failure to do much about this. I've, you know, I've, after spending a lot of time on the buy side of healthcare, for the, you know, courtesy of, of, of Stanford, you know, I've now returned to my, my original interest as a doctor, which is the production side of healthcare. You know, how do we go about producing healthcare uh, less expensively? Year after year after year, how do we get that three to four percent, or two to three percent would be fine. Two to three percent increase in miles per gallon of health insurance fuel burned, um, and uh, and that implies both reducing spending uh, without, without at a minimum, reducing our rate of increase in uh, in, in health gain that we are getting from our, our health care system. And you know uh, Warren Buffett referred to you know healthcare spending growth in excess of GDP as uh, as the tapeworm inside the American economy, and I, I agree with him. It's it's not uh, not only for the its impact the federal on the federal budget, but also its impact on on both uh, American workers and, and private employers. Um, you know this is I decided I, I you know this is a uh, something I with help from Boeing I, I, I forced uh, Regents Blue Shield to. to to, to produce for us, and this was essentially a, a it evaluates the distribution of individual doctors in Seattle, uh, shows the, the two axes that, that, that define value. The vertical axis is the best available measures we had of quality of care of each doctor, and then the, the horizontal axis was uh, how much health insurance fuel they were burning. Uh, we used a per episode measure, but it wouldn't have mattered if we would have used a per capita measure. It would have looked quite similar. And the point of this is just to show that if you, in any industry, there's a value frontier and an index of, of, um, of how competitive or how value, value competitive any industry is, is the degree to which you know, the, the, the participants in a market are clustered at the so-called price performance frontier. And um, you know, this is an industry in which we don't have uh, much clustering. This is, uh, this is buckshot, right? <laughs> not, uh, not, not type distribution near the price performance frontier, which is, you, know, you can see where I'm headed. It's very similar to land I'm headed toward. What are the incentives that we, we use? And not only incentives, there are also issues of what's the definition of health professionalism that prevails in any country and whether it does take into account uh, affordability. Now, uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I, my bed pack I was persuaded to go along with, and I, I still think it's the right answer, but, well, maybe we, we can do better if we bundle up, you know, doctors with or without hospitals into big, bigger organizations because they can then afford the kind of infrastructure that's needed to uh, produce more health with less money year in and year out. After all, Toyota has a big engineering department. That's one of the ways they... Uh, they, they lead the pack uh, in, their, in their miles per gallon uh, rating. And so I thought I might show you the same distribution for the so-called managed care uh, uh, organizations in California. These are, not the, these are not the insurance plans. These are the risk-bearing doctor groups with or without hospital partners that, are, that for many years have, have, you know, have faced a reasonably value competitive uh, California uh, insurance market because I was interested to see if you bundle them up whether or not you get tighter uh, tighter just tight tighter movement toward the price performance frontier and this is courtesy by the way of the integrated healthcare association I chaired their their p for p uh, steering committee for the last eight years and so I had a nice on the ground uh, picture of what doctors were doing sort of at trench level to try to reduce per capita spending trend and improve quality. As you can see, we, we don't have a tight <laughs> clustering uh, here either, suggesting to me that, um, among other, actually it suggests a number of things to me, but we're just, we were not close to where we need to be in, even in a California market where half of the, uh, half of the private market is in HMOs, which to varying degrees have transferred insurance and quality risk down uh, to, uh, to the provider level. So um, clearly what we've had in California, I think, has been directionally correct, but, but certainly uh, it's, it's not, its intensity has, uh, has, has fallen short. And also remember uh, that if you just take the HMO segment, of, which is a big segment of the California private insurance market, it's still a minority of, of revenue coming to, uh, to most doctors and hospitals in California. So there's a, there's a signal clarity problem in terms of signal for, for value improvement, faster value improvement. And by the way, here, I'm showing you total cost of to, total per capita cost rather than per episode cost. Some people don't like the episode uh, grouping, so here's the here's the other way for those of you who prefer the, the per capita rather than the, the per episode. But we're we're pretty far pretty far off. And you know, if you look at these numbers and say whether irrespective of whether you're talking about individual doctors or groups of doctors, if we could get clustering, you know, at the at the frontier, 
even though that wouldn't solve the dynamic problem of healthcare spending uh, every year outgrowing our GDP, it would at least on a one-time basis do a world of good. I estimate it would reduce per capita spending, uh, re uh, reduce per capita spending in the U.S. by about 15 to 20 percent. And if you assume that we're, you know, real points, and that if you assume we're, we're, we're you know, that the, that 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 gap in the uh, in the tapeworm's jaws uh, is about two and a half percent a year. It means it would solve our problems for, for what, a good ten years, depending on how, how the compound interest works. So it's, it would be a nice a nice temporary source of relief. But in the end, it's a, it's a first derivative problem. We got to figure out how we how we cause America's doctors, hospitals, drug companies, health plans to to deliver you know their uh, without lowering the rate of of, uh, of health improvement and, and and improvement in patient experience of care. We have, to, we have to figure out how to how to how to do that with uh, with about two to three percent less health insurance fuel every year than the year before because that's what it will take to neutralize the cost additive impact of population aging, the fact that a wealthy a wealthy society likes to spend more money uh, on health care and on biomedical technology, which which is doing good things for us. We don't want to suppress it. Um, now there are a few problems. You know wh why why haven't we been more successful? Well, here's here's my everybody. I mean, there's so many easy so many ways of categorizing this. This is my you know this is a reflection you know on having spent you know a lifetime both on the private purchaser side, uh, on the uh, on the public purchaser side, courtesy of uh, of MedPAC, and then and then for the last two years, and obviously before that in, earlier in my career. Uh, with those doctors and hospitals that were really interested, really working on this problem of how do you reduce per capita spending. It's one of the advantages of living in California where there's been a long, long tradition of managed care medical groups with and without hospitals. And these are the, these are the, 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 the four, four dragons uh, along the way. And you, you, the, in the end, solving for all four of these, I think is necessary to achieve that two to three percent. Um, annual growth and solve the first derivative problem. You know, first we have to acknowledge that it's not exactly we haven't created a so-called you know a value competitive you know, healthcare industry, and so understandably, the uh, the clinical re the ability to continuously examine your production processes and come up with better, less expensive ways of, of doing things are, are immature in this industry compared to other industries in the U.S. that have been subject to a lot more pressure. Commercial airlines uh, being uh, uh, an example. Uh, the other problem is that, you know, despite our efforts to, you know, to create incentives to produce more health and burn less health insurance fuel per person per year in the course of doing it, if you were to do a diagnostic and say, at the end of the day, whether it's, you know, Ascension or any other, you know, healthcare organization, and say, well, at the end of the day, you know, what percentage of your total revenues uh, actually go up if you produce more health with less money? Uh, the answer is, for most of them, is, is less than 10 percent. It's trivial. And those that, that can answer differently, like Kaiser Permanente, uh, you know, y yes, theoretically, they could be producing a lot more health with a lot less money. But it's hard to do. You know, it's hard to continuously study and redo your processes. And if you aren't facing a, a tightly competitive market, which Kaiser is not, you know, they've got, they've got very slow-moving uh, competition, you're not going to push your doctors and your nurses uh, uh, really hard to uh, to to uh, to do everything you might do, uh, since your incentives are, are are in the end of the day uh, much better aligned. A uh, third problem, which is you know courtesy of Sarah Palin, but everyone knew it was always there, is in relation to health services. A little different than most other services in that people do have a very uh, deep-rooted fear of scarcity. So anything that you might do that might represent a progressive policy that uh, that begins to even hint that uh, that. To the public, that you, when the chips are down and your your life or your family's life or, or, or ability to function, you know, might be at risk, that the money might not be there. It it just doesn't. It's so easy to uh, to, to, to 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 manipulate that. And last but not least, you know, we have splintered payers. I mean, the the question of single payer versus multi payer, it's it doesn't. What we need is is harmonized payers. You know, Germany's got it. You know, a bunch of other countries, you know, have it. And and otherwise, the doctors and hospitals on the receiving end of the money, you know, get these you know crazy mixed signals, which I think Ziad will will uh, will confirm. Um, now, um, what, what are some you know promising at the margin? You know, I spent the last I've switched now. I spend most of my time now working with doctors and hospitals who are actually uh, at the cutting edge of producing more health with less money, and um, what, what you know what's going on around them that causes them to do it. Well, you know, one idea, and this is uh, is in addition to reforming payment, 
uh, it might also make sense to begin to more strongly incentivize uh, enrollees in plans to tilt toward those doctors and hospitals that are generating more health with less money. Uh, the, the consumer incentive side that Joe, uh, Joe touched on. I think it can work. This is simply an experiment that I was permitted to do with the, the big hotels and the, uh, the large union uh, in Las Vegas. You know, we constitute a big share of the private market there, so you know, we, we have an impact, in which we simply, you know, this was, uh, this was one of sort of low moments in my, benefits, my prior benefits consulting career because the initial blowback was beyond belief. But anyway, what we did is we just, we, we, we ran profiles of the doctors, much like the, I got the regents to do, and we simply eliminated from the network a bunch of doctors that were you know, producing less health with more money. And, uh, and it, was a, it was a nightmare. It was on the, you know, it was the, you know, the, the, both, the, both the employers and the union called me two days later saying, you know, what in the world have you gotten us into? But fortunately, they stayed tied to the mast. And you saw, you can see what happened uh, a year later. And, uh, and two years later, in the end, we generated about an $85 million gain in this plan uh, relative to either uh, concurrent trend that of other you know, similar plans in the market or relative to historical trend. And it was a big victory. It worked. I mean, what was, I think what's little understood about this experiment is that the big savings was not from dropping the fuel inefficient doctors. It was from the salutary effect on practices of all those that survived and knew we were coming back next year and the year after uh, to further trim. That's, that's where we got most of the 85, 80% of the savings. Um, now, we're not the only ones who've done this. I mean, this is because this is something, because I know we're, you know, we've made progress on payment reform. I want to emphasize this, that I think one of the catalysts to making progress would be uh, to begin to incentivize uh, patients to lean toward uh, more cost-effective uh, doctors. Here are the results from, uh, from the, the state employee purchasing plan in Minnesota. A very much, you know, underappreciated uh, organization, and I, I, you know, they basically did something similar. They began to incentivize their their members to tilt toward uh, physician organizations, meaning uh, primary care groups, some as small as five or six doctors, some uh, larger health systems like uh, large groups like Park Nicolette, with and without hospital affiliations. And they just, they just, they did to to doctors what uh, what historically has been done with drugs. They just tiered it. And they began to keep it simple for the, for the consumers, saying, if you select, you know, you're, as your lead doctor, a doctor from group A, uh, you will pay less. Uh, and if you, uh, you, you can, whether it's denominated per, you know, per, per, for your, your insurance premiums or your out-of-pocket exposure is, I think, irrelevant. There are theories about this, but I, I think it's not, it's a level of detail not important. And what I, what I love about them is they've had good years and bad years, but not on average, and this is not inflation adjusted, they have held six-year trend uh, to about 3.3%, uh, and that's before uh, you know, adjusting for inflation. It's a phenomenal track record, suggesting to me that this is something that, that could, could help. And, and you know, I had suggested as a MedPAC commissioner you know, that we begin to do this in Medicare fee-for-service. It was considered, like so many of my suggestions, a political non-starter, but I still <laughs> think it's a good idea. Um, now, the other opportunity, obviously, is uh, to the degree we can, we can put enough you know, incentives on the mind, line. It's conceivable that we could we could get some big jumps in 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 uh, in, the, in lowering the rate of per capita spending. This is an experiment I did in 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 partnership with with uh, Boeing was the was the purchaser at the table willing to push their their suppliers. This was um, the Everett Clinic, Virginia Mason, and a big IPA uh, in uh, in Renton, Washington. Uh, to implement a, a new, uh, an innovation in care delivery that I just notionally gave the name, uh, I had designed it with some other doctors, of an ambulatory care ICU. Essentially, it was the, it was the hot spotting idea, but uh, conceived in 2005 and then implemented uh, uh, about three or four years before the hot spotting article was, was published in The New Yorker. And this just gives you a sense of, of the, op the, the, the size of the opportunity that are available, that is available. And these are the people who are spending the most money uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Boeing uh, health plan, or predicted to spend the most money, people with severe uh, chronic illness. And I think without going through the, the detail here, the bottom line is we were through an innovation in care delivery uh, we essentially intensified you know, um, upfront care for these medically unstable patients, but did so in an economical way. I mean, that's the key, right, is that we have, uh, if you look at the Medicare demos, which is essentially, uh, you know, on average a train wreck of situation, 
it, many of them actually did reduce hospitalizations and, um, and emergency room use. They just didn't pay enough attention to producing those, those, gain, those savings uh, more uh, very economically. And here what we did is we, we, you know, we tried to lean toward telephonic interactions and health coaches, not $150,000 a year advanced practice nurses, which is, a, a, you know, it w wipes out your savings very quickly. Um, and so, you know, it's funny, I, I realize this is, you know, having, you know, I realize that, you know, the partisanship's probably gotten worse since I graduated from MedPAC, but, you know, th at the end of the day, if you look back over 10 years, what you realize is that Clinton, Bush, uh, you know, whether, whether the country was being run by uh, Clinton, Bush, or, or, uh, or Obama, you begin to see a convergence as to a general direction as to how we might solve the first derivative problem. Uh, the vertical axis is the, uh, is the, is the uh, the rate at which we uh, is the value of um, of, uh, of of our health spending, meaning it's health gain per dollar of health insurance fuel burned. What we're trying to do is is we want we want that to go up by both reducing the denominator and improving uh, and making more progress on the numerator. Um, it began with uh, you know in, in in you know a writer I mean, the Clinton put put in the National Quality Forum, but then you have to give credit to Tom Scully and Bush for beginning to really push this transparency. Uh, in comparison, and uh, and we began the era of increased value transparency, um, and and I think the Affordable Care Act did a nice job of propelling that even further forward, down to the level where there's the most leverage on healthcare spending, which is individual doctor uh, decision making. That is, for the, we're now headed, you know, absent uh, any derailment, uh, toward being able to compare doctors and hospitals on on value. That is both quality and and uh, and relative efficiency. Once you've got that, then the, the two respective buyer groups in the U.S., the private sector and the public sector, can, can, make, can do something with that. The, um, the public sector, which is not in a position to, uh, I'm sorry, the private sector, which is not in the, unlike Medicare, not in the position of making sure that, the, that, these, that, these, that these payment reform deals actually generate savings. The private sector can't, how the insurance plan is going to say to, you know, look, look what happened in Massachusetts. We had, we had bundled payment in Massachusetts, but, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, and the other, the other payers there, they were facing big, tough, you know, uh, provider systems. And, um, and you don't say to them, well, let's come up with a bundled price that's actually going to save us money next year. That's not the way it worked. And read Martha Coakley's report if you want to see the, the gory details. No, the, the pro payment reform is something that, that by and large, the government's going to have more luck with than, than the private sector, although I congratulate and support all efforts uh, to reform payment on the, uh, on the private side. The private sector has, has much more flexibility than the government to incentivize movement of patients uh, toward doctors and hospitals. And I really have to applaud a lot of America's health insurers who over the last you know, seven or eight years, 10 years, really created these value-based network plans. Uh, the problem was that, the, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the employers uh, really were quite disappointing. They didn't move their population into these, uh, these value-based network plans because it's obvious that it's, you know, people don't like to be, uh, to be separated from their doctors, as we learned in the Las Vegas uh, blowback. But if we could get these two engines of these two types of incentives, incentives for consumers to shift to more cost-effective doctors and hospitals, Incentives for uh, for providers through through bundled payments and shared savings that that begin to encourage this you know success in in uh, every year in in generating more health with less with less and burning less health insurance fuel in the process. Uh, we could then move move into uh, the same kind of continuous re process reengineering in, in healthcare that occurs in uh, in other uh, big American more com more competitive uh, industries. And then we get this, what Alan Antobin, my colleague at Stanford, refers to <laughs> improvements in value for money, which is what we're what we're looking for. And it's funny, it, 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 you know, though, though the parties do differ in terms of the main steward that they, they would like to see operate, you know, the whether it's the uh, whether it's you know regulation or consumer incentives, this this general plan. If you I essentially bundled the two political positions in my value sensitivity uh, bubble, but essentially there there is convergence on the uh, on the general direction. Um, let me close with this you know photo this Photoshop uh, you know uh, photo. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, as you get near the end of your, your MedPAC term, you begin to sort of see the big picture, and I think probably most MedPAC commissioners you know, who are more, who were more, more, more under, who better understood how Washington works knew this coming in. I sort of figured it out in the, sort of the, my second term. But we, we, we do, are, there's no question that we have the, the doctors and hospitals in the U.S. 
if you look at what the best, you know, the most, the best run organizations are doing, we've got the right stuff to produce more health with less money and, and I think, you know, reduce per capita spending trend by about two to three uh, percentage points. Um, but, but get, you know, allowing the right in, the incentives to sort of, you know, to, to, to get into place uh, is, 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 a, is a very tough uh, political challenge. I mean, look at the, you know, I mean, look what Nancy Ann DeParle had to do to get what she got, you know, from the, from the health industry. It was, it was not easy, and, and look, it passed, the law passed with very few votes. It's not, not easy to essentially, you know, uh, to get a, you know, a very, a very well-funded industry like our health industry uh, agreeable to incentives that would force them uh, to uh, continue to produce more health with less money uh, every year. Um, if I were to pick the three bellwethers that I would focus on as to whether or not we're going we're gonna to make progress, you know, this time, meaning the next 10 years, and solve the kind of problems that, uh, that Alice and Joe uh, talked about, here's what I would focus on. Uh, will we get to a situation where value-based payments, whether it's in the form of bundled payments or shared savings, you fill in the blank, considerably exceed 10% of total revenues to American doctors and hospitals. It's inconceivable to me that anybody would go through the pain of re-engineering their clinical processes unless a very big share of their revenue, whether it's from the government or government funding or private sector funding, was, uh, was value, very intensely uh, value, value sensitive. Second question I would ask is, uh, and Ziad, I apologize to you in advance for this, but uh, will, will antitrust enforcement intensify sufficiently uh, to, to curb the, uh, those, those doctors and hospitals that constitute market dominant slackers? That is, what's, what's interesting is that you, you know you do have some health systems that uh, even though they're market dominant have really you know, said we're gonna do something about trend and are pushing toward it. I mean, I, I'll disclose that I'm on the board of Intermountain Healthcare, but I mean, I love what, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. I was only been on the board less than a year, and, and the board, you know, adopted a resolution saying across all our health plans, Medicare, Medicaid, and private, beginning in 2015, we're going to hold annual per capita premium growth, you know, holding benefits constant to no more than CPI plus one, which is, you know, pretty, pretty much pretty reason, generally correspond with, uh, with the GDP plus one that uh, was referred to uh, earlier. So there, you know, it's, it's not market dominance per se, it's market dominance and, 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 and the willingness, and the question is what do you do with that market dominance? Do you essentially make a contribution to your community by producing more health with less money, or do you slack? Do you just say, well, let's just you know, infinitely use our market power to raise prices and, and, and let's, not, let's not deal with the internally stressful clinical process re-engineering, which, which is, it can be done, but it's hard to do. Um, and, then, and then the last question, which is the, this is part of my ongoing every five-year dialogue with Joe, is can we get the, you know, should we just blow up, you know, employer-sponsored health insurance, take away the, <laughs> the tax advantage? Uh, or, and, and, and I think, you know, the employers, I think, I mean, David Lansky will address this, but I think employers, you know, are, I think the, if, if the Cadillac tax sticks, uh, it might then begin to induce some of the employers to then, to you know, to pull out the the, the welcome welcome mat for for what what Karen Ignani's uh, troops are beginning to uh, put together, which is these these sort of value focused uh, value based uh, tier, so tier, tiered network and narrow network insurance plans, in which the you get a much better deal on your health insurance if you're willing to to focus to take your business primarily to the doctors and hospitals that score better on on a combination of low total cost uh, and. Uh, and and quality. So it's it's. Uh, I agree with Warren Buffett. I think it's. Uh, I think you know healthcare spending growth in excess of our ability to afford it. You know is uh, is a tapeworm uh, inside uh, our economy, and um, and uh, and I think we do have the you know the basic ingredients to uh, to sort of uh, continuously you know improve our production processes in, in healthcare to uh, to neutralize that two to three percentage point real percentage point first derivative problem, but, uh, but whether we've got the, uh, whether we can get there politically is, uh, is TBD. And the alternatives obviously are, are, are horrible. Uh, whether it's, uh, without, I think all, most of us in the room understand what the alternatives are if we, if we don't do it, and they're just, they're, they're not, not good. So yeah? Wonderful. Thank you. Arnie, thank you very much. You know, Ziad, when I think of uh, Ascension, I think of an, a healthcare organization that's really trying to walk the walk these days, which is, which is not always easy. And maybe you can share a little bit of that perspective. 
Sure. Um, uh, thanks, uh, CC. Ascension is the largest non-for-profit healthcare provider in the United States. Uh, um, we have uh, sixteen billion dollar of revenue, but spent one point five billion in charity. As a Catholic organization, we're very committed to the poor. We are very diverse as an organization. That's why the, the real world tag is often accompanies us because we are in certain market um, the dominant um, uh, regional uh, system, like our 12 hospitals in Austin, Texas, that are a regional system um, that has 50% of the market share. But then we also are in Providence in DC, very small hospital, charity hospital here in town, or St. Agnes in Baltimore, with rural hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, you name it, um, uh, good or bad in American healthcare, we have it somewhere. <laughs> okay. So uh, the, the CFO came to me um, a couple of months ago and she said, yeah, you're, you're my chief medical officer and, and how can you and I influence the uh, training and the development of the CFO of the future if as the chief medical officer you were to design your CFO partner in the future in every hospital, what would they be like? I said, with terrible schizophrenia. Uh, and she said, most of them are already there. <laughs> because we do have a point of view that wants to walk the walk. We understand that it's about uh, accountability to, to um, caring for populations. We, 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 our point of view is that fee-for-service is not the future, is not sustainable. Um, it's about producing value and accountability for populations. We also know that we have to reduce our cost structure, and we also know um, that, that we have to, to look at appropriateness of, of medical care around the country, the, the non-sustainable rate of uh, MRIs and high-contrast CTs, are not only a cost challenge, but we kill people every year in this country with radiation uh, causing leukemias and, and uh, uh, other radiation hazards just by the number of, um, of radiologic procedures we, we, we do. So, so with this in mind, how do we approach it? How do we, what are the difficulties we, we um, get to? So, um, this room has been talking about healthcare um, expenditure since the morning. <coughs> The, the uh, contribution of medical technology vendors, for example, has not been mentioned. Okay. Not to pick on vendors, some of them are great people, they make great things for, for patients, uh, but, but um, uh, they see that their customer, their distribution channel is the, is the physician, their customer is the physician, not the hospital, and they spend a significant amount of money on SGNA. If that business model was to change and if the cost structure uh, was, was not, uh, if they were not targeting the individual physician to always use the newest technology, which the titanium uh, joint uh, that, that uh, Tom was mentioning over breakfast, um, not, not every 85-year-old needs the most expensive uh, joint, but, but that's a big chunk of money that uh, nobody mentions because of lobbying, because of other factors. I, I do not truly understand why it's never on the, um, on the radar and why medical technology vendors are not consider, considered in the same mix of, of healthcare um, uh, stakeholders who should be accountable for their share of um, uh, savings. Another um, uh, aspect of our difficulties is, you know, have said it multiple times, the competing incentives, a, a, any phys primary care physician practice. And by the way, not all physicians are the same, and primary care physicians don't make a lot of money, and, and, and they, they, they don't derive as much pleasure from doing their, their work as they used to in the past. Hassle factors are, are increasing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then imagine if, you have, if you're seeing 20 to 30 patients a day, um, now for, for, for two of them, uh, they come with this uh, new incentive model with the payor that is looking for value, but the other 18 are regular fee-for-service, and, and then you have the unannounced uh, crisis in the office every day. It is just impossible to have double standards in the practice and to design one practice uh, 
um, uh, by crunching numbers because that's how physicians have learned to adapt. Uh, they were told this is market capitalism. They were told it's fee for service. They were told that if they take care of a uh, simple yeast infection on the phone, they will not get paid and they will essentially pay for it out of their pocket. And uh, But if they see that person with the minor condition in the office, they will be paid. So they learned how to be paid like any one of us in the room would, would, would do to, to make a, a, a normal living. Um, so, so all of a sudden now you keep um, uh, the 1,500 patient panel that an average internist has in this country, you, you take these 1,500 patients and you said, well, but for these 50 of them that belong to this enlightened insurance, there is this particular plan and we want you to work with this case manager that works for the insurer, not for you and for this other plan, we want you to work with somebody else. It's, it, it's not, it doesn't work. Additional um, um, aspects of, of the complexity of, of healthcare spending is the local competition. Again, as a country, we think that competition is good and, and market capitalism is the best thing in the world in, in, in healthcare as well. And, um, and we look at markets where there are um, horizontal uh, monopolies by physicians, not because they're evil people, but because the market is too small to have more than three electrophysiologists or two electrophysiologists. So you take a small um, uh, city of uh, 500,000 uh, to a million people, and we have a couple of these in our organization, and you have two hospitals that take care of the whole city, and then you have three physicians of a given specialty that are in the same group, and they can very easily punish a hospital by moving all their business to another. These are realities that make some hospitals extremely different from Geisinger and Intermountain Healthcare, or a regional system, or a niche hospital, small hospital that only has 5% market share of a big um, cosmopolitan area. And, and, and these, these um, uh, difficulties possibly could be solved by just incentives, like, like economists like to do, but but, but, but we perceive it as much more challenging than just a game of changing the incentives. Um, we, we also have uh, additional challenges at the physician's level with Congress practicing medicine without a license. Now, <laughs> people, um, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny with this, uh, I did read the ACA when the, the, as, as passed. I did read it. Um, and, and I don't know how many of you noticed that it specifically cites that, that pro screening for prostate cancer shall be paid for. Now, we know this is a useless uh, procedure for the population. Now, for certain individuals with strong family history, it can be appropriate and it can, be, it can save lives. So you cannot say we should stop paying for it because for some people it is important, but for the majority it's not. But somebody, you know, Baba lobbied uh, their congressman, who who does have a big prostate, and then, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it is in the law. <laughs> it is in the law. I mean, the the so so the the comments earlier about comparative research are great, but but we don't need a whole lot more res. Well, I should not say it like this. We do need a lot more research, but we are not acting on what we already know. We already know a lot, and we're not acting on it because of the, the, the mixed incentives. Um, thinking that having choices between fee-for-service and uh, payment for value, uh, we, we continue to think that the, b both systems can coexist peacefully, and, and, and we believe it's very hard, and, and, and they cannot. Um, a couple more things. Uh, my feelings were hurt with the cheap shot at SMU because that's where I got my MBA. Um, what else? Um, that, these, these are my comments. I'll be happy to take any questions. That's it. <laughs> you got SMU in there. Well, that's great. Uh, yes. <laughs> it, it, on that note, um, I am mindful. Thank you, thank you Zian. <laughs> Uh, it looks as if Paul wants to come to the microphone and probably try to keep us on schedule. Is that well, right, Paul? Well, a little, a little bit of that, but Paul is also trying to uh, be observant of our web audience. And uh, a gentleman named Rafael Maldonado 
asks, we have talked about structural and culture change in Medicare. U.S. healthcare system is termed to be rationalist and operating from a top-down management. Do you feel that a bottom-up management system would operate more efficiently? Who would like to take well, Raphael's question? question. Here's the Arnie? Well, it, 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 one of the interesting characteristics of the American healthcare system is that uh, a tremendous amount of leverage does happen to exist at the level of the individual physician. I mean, I think if you were to figure out, you know, say, what is, the, what is the highest leverage point in American healthcare value it's, uh, and, and influence, it's, it's doctors. Uh, a, because you know, uh, most, most people in their healthcare are subject to what the social psychologists would refer to as very strong familiarity bias. You know, particularly if you've got an illness, you know, you're, you're very reluctant to, uh, to switch doctors or to, um, or to um, uh, decide that uh, even though the doctor you've known for a long time has referred you to specialist A, you're going to use specialist uh, B. So I think it, you know, the, the, uh, there is, uh, and also, you know, probably even though physicians, you know, throw their hands up sometimes, nobody has more influence on patient behavior than physicians when they take the time to do something uh, about it, which is uh, not as often as it might, might, it might be. So I think you, you, you do, I mean, the question is, what, what does the bottom refer to? Does it refer to uh, patients? Does it refer to, uh, to, to frontline physicians? I do think if I had to pick, you know, one leverage point on which to focus, uh, it would be uh, incentives at the individual doctor level because the entire healthcare supply chain, as well as as well as patients, are disproportionately uh, subject to uh, to physician influence. And I think that's where I, that's where I would focus. And and I think everything that we've heard from this panel in terms of you know changing incentives uh, would uh, would affect uh, physicians. Whether you you change payment to uh, to reward value, or you you change consumer incentives to tilt toward um, more cost-effective doctors and hospitals. I mean, that's what we saw in Las Vegas, right? Essentially, what the big effect we got from the doctors who remained in the network was they changed uh, they changed their practice because we we were able to uh, begin to sing, send a powerful signal that a very big share of the private sector market, where all the where all the you know, the margin comes from in physician practices, was going to tilt toward a combination of low per capita spending and uh, and high quality. Yeah, I, I totally agree with, with uh, Ernie. I, I want to add, though, one, one caveat, which is the regulatory difficulties as, as one tries to implement local systems like that. So ACOs are great um, as, a, as a concept. Um, having put a couple of them um, together in a few of our markets, I realize that uh, most healthcare systems do not have the actuarial knowledge to, to have successful ACOs, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the ground, uh, the grassroots leadership of the doctors is limited um, because the um, uh, business infrastructure that is needed and the actuarial infrastructure that's needed is often lacking. An additional issue is the um, when we started talking to our CEOs and our CFOs about accountable care organizations, they said, what do you mean we're going to decrease hospitalizations on, on the uh, mm -hmm. enrolled members? And, and, and that's a true problem because they live in this, in this two business models world. And we said, no, we're going to do it. And by the way, that will give you better knowledge of um, your patients and their utilization of services, which helps you keep them inside your system rather than you can start looking at the leakage, and that can give you some financial incentive to, to reduce, the, you will reduce their hospitalizations overall, but they will all happen inside your system, so you can be okay. Next thing you know, I get pulled off by our general counsel who said, you can't say that. So what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to help the CEOs work with the physicians on making population health happen and improving quality and reducing costs. He said, no, you have encouraged self-referral. You're breaking star claw. When, when you say that, when you tell the CEOs that it could work, because it will also help you keep all your business inside, and that's a good transition strategy. So now I have the CFO and the general counsel. I'm not kidding. I have them both sitting on the quality committee because everything we do has, has to have a lot of lawyering uh, with it. And, 
and that's just the reality we live in. Is there another question or comment? Yes, come on up. Uh, hi, Gene Sterling, uh, the Urban Institute. Uh, I, I'm one, I've, I found an interesting distinction between this panel and the first panel uh, in the sense that there's a difference, I think, a little bit between the budget people who come to health, uh, like Alice, and the people, the health people who come to the budget. And sometimes I liken the problem in healthcare to like, we're going to, it's an open-ended system, which, which from budget terms is not acceptable in place else. So say in public housing or housing vouchers, it's a horrible system, 30, 50% of people qualify can't get it. So we have all these constraints that you wouldn't absolutely tolerate. If it had been an open-ended system and we tried to back out of that to keep it a budget, we have a problem. So sometimes I worry when we talk about all these experiments, value-based systems, all these things we're going to do in the future with an open-ended system, whether that can work without the budget constraint that, Zed, you mentioned that Intermountain Health was self-enforcing by trying to put a budget constraint. Don't you have to have the budget constraint to have people adopt the incentives? Can you really have an open-ended system and then hope people are gonna put in these side incentives? Or aren't you like, like a house that opens itself to all the animals and the giraffes come in and they stick their heads to the roof and everything else and you try to put some feed out the back door to try to have them a few of them walk out so it's not so crowded? <laughs> the, the problem, Gene, is that it's really hard to appropriately, um, I would say, calibrate the risk. Uh, and what I'm talking about and what I think is actually the future is what you want is to have what I will call firm targets and tie the incentives of the clinicians to the target so you get them with us rolling in the same direction toward the promised land. But you're not going to do that unless you get the clinician on the ground with their hospital partner, with the cooperating specialist, which will not be all of them, <laughs> but some of them, maybe two-thirds of them, that may be all we need. And you, and you align them. That's what I mean by incentive realignment. And then it, the turbocharger bring the patient into this. You know, the idea of having the patient, of what you call it, leaning toward, I would say um, strongly encouraged to. But what we know from the way the survey data have changed over time, you know, 20 years ago, people weren't all that excited about um, having uh, choice limited now they'll pay, they'll do it to save money because it's gotten so expensive. But they have to be shown that in fact the choice is not going to kill them. So you got to, that's why the quality metric business is so crucial. So I would say the problem with the hard, what I call spreadsheet economics cap, is that it's unrealistic about what the system can do and it shifts risk too, too abruptly to patients and providers. But a target to which they're tied. It'll happen because they want it to happen. That's the only way it's going to happen. Well, in the interest of time, I think we're going to take maybe a 10 to 15 minute break. Is that OK? 10 minute break. I'm, Paul wants to make it five, but I don't think that's fair. So we'll say 10. <laughs> See you back in 10. Thank you all, gentlemen. <laughs> OK. So. We've heard the federal budget perspective, a little bit bleak if you ask me, um, but during the break, Alice did assure me that, that work is underway to, uh, to try to tackle some of these things. So hope, hope remains. Um, and then of course, we got more into the medicine side of this problem of healthcare spending and the federal deficit. And the next thing that we're going to do is take up really um, what I posed as sort of the central riddle in my opening remarks, and that is what might be considered a sustainable health spending path. And so to do that, we're going to first hear from Charlie and, and then Don. So take it away. Thank you, Cece, and um, welcome, everybody. Um, I want to extend my thanks as well to everyone for uh, being here and all the speakers, uh, particularly to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for helping to uh, make this possible, and also to Paul Hughes Cromwick, who is our inside guy who most of you have gotten to know pretty well, and he's the one who really pulled all of this together. Um, this symposium came kind of naturally out of the research agenda we set for our center and our center is about sustainable health spending and helping get the nation toward that. And um, 
the first thing we set out to do was to measure health spending and prices and utilization and employment on a more timely basis so we could be tracking more immediately what's really happening with spending. And the second thing was to come up with some, uh, some guidelines for, for judging whether that rate of increase in spending is is appropriate, sustainable is a, is a good word. It's, we put it in our center. So, you know, what would be a sustainable rate of increase in spending so we can make sense of the data that we've generated? Um, we will then be moving on to doing some forecasting, um, continue analyzing the uh, drivers of healthcare spending growth, getting involved in prevention uh, in more detail. And um, ultimately, you know, we, we are looking to be advocating for change, too. So that, that's kind of where we're headed. Um, this um, presentation is going to be much more about what would be a sustainable rate of increase in spending rather than how would we get there. That was a great panel uh, there on, on some of the things that we can do to get there. But, but mercifully, um, those problems aren't my problem today. My problem today is to uh, just try and talk about what it might be. Um, here, is, uh, here is the center leadership. The uh, pictures have been photoshopped a bit to make us look better. And uh, I thought I would just say a quick word about uh, some of the, about the folks who are all here today. Um, Ani Turner, who's sitting over here, is our deputy director. Um, she produces our employment brief and is and also leads our work in uh, health workforce supply and requirements forecasting. Uh, George Miller, lower left, where's George? Here's George. He is uh, he is an institute fellow here um, who unfortunately got his degree in operations research, and so we've been doing remedial training to get him uh, to be an economist, and he's actually doing very well at it. And George is, is our, uh, you know, what do we spend on prevention expert and modeling prevention versus treatment and looking at what the optimal mix might be there. And then Paul hughes Cromwick, who I think most of you know, uh, is our outreach director, and uh, Paul produces our price brief. By the way, George does our spending brief. Um, and I'm, um, I have been mostly working on this what is, what would be a sustainable rate of increase in spending over the last eight or nine months. And have, we've done four kind of technical blogs on the topic. Uh, this briefing has material from those blogs, and then I'm ending with a, a new chart that uh, may be in, in an August blog. So um, let's start off with, you know, what do we mean by a sustainable rate of increase in spending? We, we thought about this and came up with what you see uh, on the screen. We consider the nation to have achieved a sustainable health spending when the projected growth path is within what the nation is willing and able to pay while meeting access and quality goals. So there's an element of choice in this. You know, this isn't like a physics problem where something is totally unsustainable or, you know, mathematically can't happen, we're, we're introducing choice here, and if there's an absence of willingness to pay, then it's an unsustainable rate of increase, even if you could. Um, so with that, if you try to operationalize that kind of definition, you immediately run into the fact that there are multiple stakeholders who are paying for health care, and when spending goes up, are affected by it. and. Uh, federal and state governments, employers who offer insurance, and families and individuals either with insurance or who have no insurance and, and are trying to purchase it somewhere uh, or paying out of pocket. Um, we ended up deciding to focus primarily on the federal government sustainability. And that was uh, in part because of the Affordable Care Act in which the government is essentially saying, okay, you know, if you're an individual out to purchase health insurance, uh, you know, we've kind of figured out how much you can afford to spend on it, and we're not going to, we're going to make it available to you at what you can afford. And furthermore, we've got some actuarial guidelines to make sure it's adequate insurance. So if spending increases are affordable by the federal government while they continue to pay Medicare, Medicaid, exchange subsidies, and live up to that commitment, uh, 
to offering affordable insurance, then it should be sustainable to individuals as well. So that sort of leaves state governments and employers out, uh, you know, yet to be determined. But And so what we're doing is saying, well, let's see what's sustainable for the federal government and then look at that rate and ask ourselves, is that rate likely to be sustainable for state governments and uh, um, employers as well? So that that's where we come down on that. Um, some assumptions that uh, lie behind the calcul the results that I'll be showing you in a moment. So we, I picked a period, of, I picked 2035 at a point where we need to be uh, balancing the federal budget while paying for health care and paying for non-health care items. And um, that's sort of long enough to be long term, but not so far out there to, to seem irrelevant to, especially to someone like me who's getting on in years. And um, then um, in terms of tax revenues, which is a key part of what the government can afford, I'm not taking a stand on what I think that is or will be. Instead, I'm kind of looking across a range and seeing what the implications are for different revenues, because that's trying to predict what the public will be willing to put forth in taxes by 2035 is kind of beyond my, my abilities. Um, the third item should be beyond my abilities, uh, but I'm still taking a stand on it, which is federal outlays for non-health items. I'm setting those to lower levels. So, you know, if you think about it, what, what the federal government will have to spend on health care in 2035 is what they take in in their revenues and minus what they have set aside to spend on non-health. So you have to have an assumption about what they're going to spend on the non-health items. And I'm setting those to what I call low levels. Uh, so you're, uh, you're kind of biasing it in that direction. And I'll show you what I used uh, in a moment. Now, another assumption is that there's a single underlying cost trend that pervades the health system. So um, if the system becomes more efficient, it becomes more efficient for Medicare beneficiaries and for employer-sponsored, uh, insured. Uh, it, it goes across the system. And, and this cost trend, think of it as the rate of increase in spending per Medicare beneficiary and the rate of increase in spending for per privately employed person, that those are going to be roughly equivalent. I assume uh, Affordable Care Act will be implemented with full Medicaid expansion. You know, I need to make some assumption there, and I'm assuming it, it uh, all happens. And then in order to put actual percentages on some of these numbers, it's important to be specific about assumptions about inflation in particular, but also the rate of growth in potential GDP, which is, by the way, full employment GDP. It's, it's what GDP would be if we got to full employment. And um, uh, the Congressional Budget Office produces estimates of the rate of growth in, in real potential GDP. Um, and then there's a catch-up, um, since we're below potential GDP now, GDP can, is going to grow faster over the next 24 years than full employment GDP because it gets to catch up to it. That adds about 0.3 percentage points. So when you put all those together, that gives you GDP growing at an average rate of 4.6%. Right? So what is the sustainable rate of increase in spending um, that can, uh, when you're using the federal government as the, uh, the sort of the litmus test? We compute what the federal government can afford to spend on health care in 2035, so that's the tax revenues minus what they set aside for non-health items. In order to live within that budget and, uh, you know, taking into account expanded coverage under the Affordable Care Act, um, taking into account that the Medicare population is growing much faster than the general population, there's a cost trend that has to be achieved uh, in order to, to stay within that budget. So we solve for what that cost trend would be, apply it then to the, the whole health system, and that tells us how much total health spending is going up. Um, so that, that's how we calculate these things. Now, 
Let me jump to what we're using for the federal non-health spending share of GDP. Uh, the first bar there shows you what it looked like just prior to the recession, and I had to do it, I wanted to do it prior to the recession because when you, you get into a recession, the, the uh, lower GDP distorts these percents and they all go up, so I picked the, the first year before the recession. So 13.5% of federal spending was for non-health items, and um, you can see the breakout there. I then took the uh, CBO extended baseline projection for 2035, and they don't give me a breakout between uh, defense and other non-health items as much as I beg for it. So I've, I've left that undetermined, but you can see, uh, and by the way, the extended baseline is the lower estimate from CBO. They also have the alternative fiscal scenario, which has got a higher number. And you can see Social Security grows from 4.2% to 6.1%. The combination of national defense and everything else drops from 93 to 7%. And I believe that that combination would be at historically low levels at that rate. So we're cutting back on defense and non-health items. Um, Quick aside, some of these non-health items are affect the social determinants of health. You know, there, there is kind of a potential health impact there, um, which we're becoming increasingly interested in. But um, what I want you to take away from this slide is that we're being very uh, stingy with our non-health spending in this scenario in this scenario. So here are Here's what comes out of our modeling. Um, on, the, uh, on the horizontal axis are the shares of GDP, different shares of GDP that might be raised in, in uh, tax revenues. And I start with 18.5% because that's the CBO uh, official alternative fiscal scenario number, long-term number. It's very close to the long-term average. It was in Joe Anto's chart I noticed earlier. So that's sort of a, uh, a common starting point. And then I kept, I kept the 0.5 percentages and just incremented by one because it conveniently gave me a 20.5%, which just happens to be very, much, very close to GDP plus zero as the sustainable rate of increase in spending. Um, if you, um, so the way you read these results, if you're at 18.5% of GDP in tax revenues, um, I just showed on the previous slide, you've got 13.1% set aside for non-health, so that gives you 5.4% of GDP to spend on federal health in 2035. Well, if you're gonna live within that budget, you have to cut the cost trend way down to the point where total national health spending is growing at GDP minus 1.4. If you have taxes at 20.5% and non-health is consuming the 13.1, you can, have, you can uh, afford health, a cost trend that's equivalent to total national health spending growing at the same rate of GDP and staying at 18% of the economy, you know, ad infinitum. Um, if you want to get to GDP plus one, then you need to go to 22.5% of tax, of revenues and taxes, okay? Now, obviously, you could say, well, I can, I can do 12.1% uh, on non-health and pick up an extra percentage point. So you can sort of shift around on this chart and do your own uh, uh, scenarios if you want. But this is uh, the one that we're focusing in on. And I want to focus in on GDP plus zero because that's such a sort of a ground zero uh, scenario to look at. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that's the answer, that that's the sustainable growth rate, but I'm saying let's pick one and pursue it a little bit further and, and in ways that I think you can play around with yourself and, and maybe run your own mental scenarios. So a little historical context. Here is the history of federal tax receipts as a percent of GDP. So, you know, it bounces around and it goes way down in uh, recessions. Uh, 
it goes way down when there are tax cuts. And um, you can see around the year 2000, it peaks up there at about 20 and a half percent. That's when the Bush tax cuts came in and then it drops down, kind of came back up and then the recession hit it and knocked it back down again. But the point here is that the 20 and a half percent of revenues needed to sustain GDP plus zero is essentially a historical high number for uh, tax revenues. Um, I'm going to now, I've been talking about what can we afford, what's sustainable in terms of what can be paid for. I want to just give a little bit on what's attainable, meaning it's one thing to say, well, GDP plus zero is it, you know, that's our sustainable growth rate. And then the question is, well, can you get there or not? And the previous panel had a lot of great discussion of ways to get there, which I, as I mentioned, don't have to address here. Uh, but I thought you might enjoy this slide as to give you some context for that. So from the formation of Medicare basically up until managed care, um, health spending was growing at GDP plus 3.2%. So it was more than 3% above GDP. This is potential GDP here, by the way, and I, I don't want to waste precious minutes getting into why I'm using that exactly, but it just gives you a much more valid result when you start looking into recessionary periods. So then managed care came along in 93, and it held spending down for a while, and then all of a sudden spending exploded in the uh, you know, 2000, 2001 timeframe. And a lot of people now bring that up and say, how spending's low now, but it was low back in the mid 90s, and so how do we, how do we know it's not gonna turn out the same way? But I think it's interesting to note that if you take the managed care period and add in the backlash and combine them, that the spending over and above GDP, the tapeworm, uh, you know, was only eating one and a half percent as opposed to the 3.2 percent that it was prior to that time frame. And then if you take the uh, middle of 2005 to present, the tapeworm's been at 0.6 percent. Uh, so GDP plus 0.6. And uh, it's significant to note, as I do in the note below here, that from July 2005 through the start date of the recession, December 2007, period of about two and a half years, it was 0.7 percent. So this, this second bend in the curve uh, occurred um, about two and a half years before the start of the recession which doesn't mean necessarily that the recession isn't responsible for some of the continued low growth, but it tells you that something happened before that that wasn't related to the economy. So let's, let's um, dig into GDP plus zero a little bit more. Um, the, the trend required if, if the federal government is going to live with uh, 20.5% of GDP in tax revenues and spend 13.1 on non-health spending, then in order to fit within that budget, the trend has to be 3.2%. So in the trend, again, think of this as the annual rate of increase in spending per Medicare beneficiary and spending per private insured. Um, if we had a stable population that didn't change in any way year after year, that would give you an increase in health spending of 3.2% per year. But the population is growing, and over the 24 years at about 0.8% per year, so that adds 0.8% per year to the growth in health spending. Population's also aging, that adds about a half a percent. We also have um, expanded coverage coming in in 2014, 15, 16 timeframe with the Medicaid expansion and the, the uh, exchange subsidies. If you take that increase and put it over 24 years, you know, what does that do to the average annual rate? That only adds about a tenth of a percentage point to the average annual rate. So this is how you come up with 4.6%
growth in national health spending. It's a 3.2 percent trend. A um, couple of things that I think are interesting. One is this: this is 0.6 percentage points below the growth in per capita GDP. So to hit GDP plus zero with the aging population and the uh, expanded coverage, you've actually got to be below per capita GDP growth. But it's also a half a percentage point above the likely growth rate and in median income. And this comes back to uh, one of Len's slides showing premiums versus median income. Um, so even though you're at this very low trend that's that it is actually slower than per capita GDP by 0.6 percentage points. Um, if the relationship between GDP per capita and median incomes continues, uh, the relationship that has been in place for 30 years, I did three 10-year looks at it, and it's, it's pretty consistent, about 1.1 percent slower than GDP per capita is what you get for growth in median income. So you're still having spending per person grow faster than median income, which means an employer who uh, has low wage workers is still going to see spending going up faster than, than wages. So it's an increasing share of wages. So you haven't really eliminated that problem, even at GDP plus zero overall. Okay, this is this is my last slide. I, I think I'll dwell on this a little bit. So I, you know, I promised to talk about a path, not just a, a number. And even if you could hold the cost trend consistently at 3.2 percent per year every year from 2012 to 2035, the um, growth path in healthcare spending wouldn't just be sitting at 4.6 per year year after year. 4.6 percent per year, year after year, and that's because the population growth isn't entirely uniform over that period. The aging of the population isn't entirely uniform over that period, and the expanded coverage, the costs of of, uh, of the Medicaid expansion and the exchange subsidies, all happens within a fairly short time frame. So what this is showing, the the blue bars are showing what the growth rate in health spending would look like if you were going to achieve GDP plus zero over the 25-year period. And basically, 4.6% 4, 4 for a couple of years. Then in 2014, the exchange, the uh, expanded coverage kicks in, and that pushes it up to 6.7. I've got it kind of coming in mostly in 2014 and a little bit in 2015 and 16. So 6.7, then 5.6, then 5.2. And then it gets down to being fairly even until you get toward the end of the period. And in the box there, by the way, I, I shift from going by individual years to five-year increments just so I could fit things on the slide. And you, so you can see in those out years, the growth rates are, are slower, and that's a combination of less aging and a little less population growth. So that's what, so if you wanted to, you know, if you believed that GDP plus zero is where we need to be, uh, then if you're tracking health spending, you could track it against these numbers. I, I have kind of a few caveats, of course, more than a few eventually, but uh, I'm a con an economist. George probably, uh, I don't know if George would give an answer or not, but <laughs> a few more years he wouldn't. So, um, so that's what that would look like. Now, the dotted line is my assumption about what's happening to the economy. And um, I sort of read a few things, read the CBO report. I, I couldn't quite figure out whether current law was causing some some so, sort of odd things happening in the next two or three years. I couldn't quite understand all of that, so I made a few things up, too. But so what you see here is I, I have the economy sort of lagging along as it has been kind of sl slowish growth until 2014 when a recovery really starts to happen. And it takes a few years to complete that recovery, and by 2019, we're, we're back to full employment. And you know that that uh, 
you know, there, there are worries about whether that's really going to happen, and that's obviously a key part of all of, of the assumption here. Um, so if, you, if that's the path of GDP, what happens is when GDP accelerates back to full employment, it grows faster than its normal rate, and it then during that period, you normally expect uh, spending growth relative to GDP to be smaller. So what happens here is if you, if you want to track relative to GDP, in 2012 and 2013, spending is going to grow a little faster than GDP because GDP is still lagging and isn't, isn't recovering like we would like it to. In 2014, its growth rate uh, jumps up as it starts accelerating back to full employment. However, that's the same year that the expanded coverage comes in. So they're both going up. And as are, but the health spending goes up a little faster. So you're still at, at uh, GDP plus 1% here. By 2015, the effect of expanded coverage is smaller. GDP is still growing faster than normal. So you're, you're at a GDP plus zero year, even though both health spending and GDP are at higher than their long-term average rates. And then you get into a period where health spending grows more slowly than GDP because GDP is still at a higher than normal rate and health spending's back to normal. And then finally in the out years, it's, it's sort of even there. Um, and okay, some, some caveats, the 4.6% in 2012. Our data are showing that 2012 is, is coming along through May looking like 4%, right? And it's been around 4% for 2009 through present, um, more or less. So that would suggest, if you look at this, that, my gosh, we're, you know, we're below GDP plus zero. You know, right now we're doing, we're doing great. Um, I think that 4.6 should probably be 4.0 just because... Um, Overall price inflation has been lower than our long-term assumption. It's been about 1.5% over the last 36 months. And uh, as, as Tom Getson will tell you, there are lagged effects of inflation on health care. And so, um, you know, I, I think probably a 4.0 in 2012 would be about right, uh, reflecting the lower price inflation than what we normally have. So, I, and we're at 4.0. So I, I think we're entering 2012 at a rate that would be consistent with uh, sustainable growth at GDP plus zero, you know, 20 and a half percent tax revenues. Um, and um, as if price inflation gets back to about 2%, 2.1%, then I'd expect spending to get up to about four, four and a half, four point six percent 4.6% to stay on this sort of GDP plus zero growth path. Um, if you think it should be GDP plus a half, just add a half to all these things. If you think it should be GDP minus a half, you can subtract a half from all these numbers. And if you think price inflation is going to be, you know, one and a half percent throughout rather than 2.1, then subtract 0.6 percent from from all of this. Um, so that is. Um, I think I'll finish there uh, other than just saying that, that my biggest concern is that the economy is, is you know, we're, we're so precarious right now. And if we, if we drift along with more prolonged high unemployment, what happens is that full employment, potential GDP growth gets, the, the target gets lower and lower. You know, eventually people become unemployable and, and eventually the lack of investment and capital and all of that cuts into labor productivity growth long term. Linda Bilheimer knows much more about that than I do. So that's one of my main concerns. Um, thank you. Great. Don? Charlie, thank you very much. Um, we're going to ask uh, Don to make, make a few comments. And, and I should note that Don, of course, is the director of the Tax Policy Center at Urban Institute here in DC. Don. Cool, thanks. So hi, everybody. It's, uh, it's fun to be here today. Uh, always think good to talk about healthcare spending and how it fits in the low overall budget situation. 
Uh, if you look at the agenda for today's talk, you will see that I am listed not as a presenter, not as a discussant, <laughs> but as a reactor. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that means, but I'm going to interpret it as that I have the right to use Charlie's slides, uh, if I can find them. So let me go back to, there. there's his big killer result. Um, Okay, so I, I think a lot about federal budget issues, and I'm one of those people who, like Alice, um, can be bleak when called upon to be bleak. Uh, so I can prepare for you scary, long-run, exponentially growing things that eventually blow up. Uh, I spent, you know, did my time at CBO, where they're very good at making those charts, um, and so I could tell you that story. A lot of those exponential growing blow-up charts, though, don't have additional constraints on them that you might think exist in the real world. And so what Charlie's doing here and what his framework tries to do, which is I think is a good idea, is to say, okay, let's actually take this problem, let's impose on it some budget constraints and some political economic constraints about how much can actually be afforded by the government and how much are people gonna be willing to spend. And then let's draw inferences from that about how much room there is for federal health spending. And then obviously his results are gonna be driven by the assumptions he makes on the front end about willingness to bear taxes and how much the government wants to spend on other things, but at least gives you a framework to begin to think about what's an actual empirically sustainable outcome uh, rather than just scary charts. Um, if you don't do that, right, there are a variety of people who don't do that. You've seen the budget ones. There's also a group of people who do that in the economic space and ask the question of how much can we as an economy afford in health spending or where might we go with that. Uh, Chad Jones and others have done that. And if you run those out, it's very easy to get scenarios where you spend 20 or 30 percent of GDP on health care. And the reason for that is basically that economists are actually quite humble about how we use our money. Right? And so if you just view it as a pure economic problem, it's, you know, well, whatever people want. And over time, we may want to spend more and more on health. Right? You know, who knows? Maybe several centuries from now, we'll spend 90 percent of GDP on health because that's what we do because, you know, we've got enough stuff. Um, the challenge that runs into uh, is that health is so uh, reliant on federal financing, government financing in general. I'm going to focus on federal here. And so for that, you know, for kind of growth of health to grow unabated, uh, you do have this issue about how much are willing, people willing to spend in terms of their tax revenues or give up in terms of other government spending uh, in order to allow uh, that increased uh, health care spending to occur. And so again, you got, need a framework to think about how that's going to balance out. Okay, so that's the framework. Uh, Charlie described it well, but just let me quickly describe it. From my point of view, I, I view it as being four basic assumptions or inputs. Uh, I mean assumption here in kind of the input sense, not in the pejorative he's making things up. Um, first one is what kind of revenue levels can we expect? Uh, like most people who do federal budget, I think of everything in terms of shares of GDP. Uh, so kind of what share of GDP are the American taxpayer going to be willing to bear in the long run? Right, so that'll set how much revenue the government has to spend for various things. Okay. To figure out how much is going to be available for health care spending, you then got to ask yourself how much is the government going to spend on other stuff. Right, so Social Security, defense, uh, all other non-interest spending. We'll come back in a moment to why interest is uh, interesting. So you need some expectations, some projections about what's being spent on all the other things the government does. And then you have kind of a judgment of, okay, is the government going to go for a balanced budget? Is it going to go for primary balance? How is it going to deal with interest? Uh, and Charlie makes the assumption that the government's, in essence, going to aim for primary balance. So that the amount of money the government's willing to spend uh, on Social Security, defense, health, other stuff, but not interest, is going to be the same uh, as the revenues come in. Right? If you're willing to make those three assumptions, then you can do a bunch of arithmetic and figure out how much spending at the federal level is going to occur on health care. Okay? That's overall spending driven by all the things that drive federal spending. Uh, if you then want to go a fourth step, which I'm not going to concentrate on so much, but maybe you all will in Q&A, but if you want to go then a step and ask, well, what does this imply about health spending in the economy as a whole, you basically take the federal growth of health spending, you strip out the things that have to do with aging population and expanding coverage and whatnot, you find out the underlying cost drivers uh, of health spending, and then you can make an assumption that that's going to be the same in the rest of the health sector, and you can therefore forecast what national health expenditures are going to be. Uh, so that's the framework. Really quite straightforward when you think about it. It makes a lot of sense as a way to frame up the problem. Uh, and like any such framework, the results you're going to get from it are going to be driven by the assumptions you make on the front end. Right? In some sense in this framework, federal health spending is a residual. Right? You determine everything else you're doing, and then it spits out at the end uh, how much room you've got for federal health spending. And anything you ever estimate as a residual, 
means, in essence, that if you have an error or if you're off in one of your assumptions, it's flowing through pretty directly into the thing you have as an outcome. And so I think it's useful to think about stress testing the various assumptions uh, that go into this model. And so first up uh, would be revenues. And, and Charlie hit the, the high points here. The scenario he focused on the most was one in which uh, federal health spending ends up at GDP plus zero. Uh, and to finance that based on his other assumptions, you need tax revenues at about 20.5% of GDP. Right, and so this chart will show you back to 1965, uh, which is you know, a year chosen a lot for these things because it's the birth of Medicaid, the birth of Medicare, and idiosyncratically, the birth of me. Um, and what you see is that tax revenues relative to GDP have this strong historical tendency to really, really want to be around 18%. If we had this conversation a couple years ago, it actually, I would have said, they really, really want to be around 18.3 or 4%, but then we've had a couple years of very low. Uh, and you'll see that we've only had one year where we got up anywhere near this 20.5 uh, in Charlie's scenario. And that was not you know, a year in which we were really, in some sense, trying to have 20 and a half. Right? That was a year right at the end of the tech boom, lots of capital gains, lots of bonuses. Right? All your friends were off starting startups and getting stock options. Right? Really extreme times uh, that we got up that high. And that, that has not been the norm for the tax system we've had. And then since then, uh, we've actually come down a lot because of weak economy and, uh, and tax cuts. And so one question is whether 20.5% for, for GDP looking out in the future is going to be a reasonable aspiration. You know, my sense is as a political economic projection that rising healthcare spending, rising spending on social security are such that it is inevitable we're going to have to get up in that neighborhood, if not higher, just because kind of the force of making the arithmetic work. But I do want to argue that that is going to require a fundamentally tax system, different tax system than the one we've had traditionally. Our current tax system doesn't scale to do that. Uh, folks who have laid out plans to try to get up that high, uh, one would be uh, the Rivlin Diminishy Commission, uh, another would be uh, Bull Simpson, they both take a hatchet to the tax code to try to design something that makes much more sense. And so the first thing I want to argue is that if aspirationally we're going to get up to 20.5% on a persistent level in order to have sustainable uh, health care spending growing at basically GDP, uh, that's going to require deep fundamental tax reform by changing the fundamental design of our tax system so that it's more efficient and can bear that higher revenue level. And that absent that, kind of the current debate we have in Washington about tweaking tax rates and all that sort of stuff just isn't the discussion you have to have in order to make this affordable. And then also notice that that will require kind of a different political economic equilibrium from the one we've had historically, right? We're going to need uh, Americans to accept a higher revenue level. Okay. Then there's non-health spending. Right, so it's a very nice chart. So I fully endorse the go back to 2007 to look at things pre-recession. I do that a lot in my work as well, kind of have a sense of what's going on. Uh, if you look at the, I guess, what is the dark blue at the bottom here, you can see what's happening with Social Security. Uh, people who have health care discussions sometimes get flippant about Social Security and say, you know, the problem is health care, yada, yada, yada. I just want to note that it's not as though Social Security isn't playing its part. Right, so we're going through a period here where it's going from being roughly in round numbers 4% of GDP to being roughly in round numbers 6% of GDP. Right, and you know, 2% of GDP is real money. Uh, and so that's happening. There are error bounds on that estimate, but that's kind of you know, a reasonable projection of what's happening. So, right, so we're going to need some way to figure out how to finance that. Even if you make some changes to the program, it's not going to be that much less than that. The one that's more interesting and more controversial is the 7% on the top. Right, as Charlie says, spending on other things excluding interest, so that would be, right, the green and the red would be non-interest, non-health, non-social security spending. So think about it as being defense, uh, think about it as being food stamps, think about it being national parks. Uh, in 2007, that made up a little bit more than 9% uh, of the overall GDP, of the overall economy. In CBO's extended baseline scenario, 25 years hence, that's down to 7%. As best I can tell, that figure has never been lower than 8% since before World War II. Right? So since the birth of the modern economy and the modern government, uh, we've always spent more than 8% of GDP on this other stuff. And now we're going to defrag the hard disk. Um, <laughs> and that was quick. Uh, and so that is, a, that is an ambitious, aggressive, choose your favorite adjective vision of a significantly smaller other government, if, if I can, relative to the size of the economy than we've had in the past. And so as Charlie hinted, right, CBO does run another scenario, which is the Extended Alternative Fiscal Scenario, uh, EAF. Uh, and in that, I should note that that 7% number there is 9.7% in 2035. 
And so if you view a CBO kind of setting out the range of where you may end up, 7 versus 9.7 is a big range. And it translates beautifully uh, one for one into what you think uh, tax revenues need to be. Right, so in this chart, if you decided that, you know, really the 7% assumption here for other spending is too low, and really it's going to be 8 or 9, you basically just move to the right columns to figure out what the sustainable level uh, of healthcare spending would be given all the other assumptions. Uh, sorry, you move to the left, right, right, for those of you who flip around. Um, and so, for example, if you thought that holding everything else of the assumptions constant, but you thought not all this other spending was going to be 8% of GDP rather than 9% than 7% of GDP, uh, you'd need uh, healthcare growing at the minus 0.7 there uh, relative to GDP rather than the zero. Okay, so I think on that front, maybe an optimistic assumption. Um, then there's the budget assumption, right? So his assumption is that what the federal government is going to do in 2035 is balance what's called the primary uh, budget deficit. So strip out interest and then have revenues equal all other spending. Now that's an interesting benchmark to target because it has the following feature. It is approximately true that if the government runs a primary balance, that over time the debt will grow at the same rate as GDP, and basically the government won't fall in percentage of GDP terms further into debt. Right, so that avoids an explosive growth rate of debt. It turns out actually under some assumptions you actually have to run small primary surpluses to make that work, so revenues have to be slightly bigger than non-interest spending. But in rough numbers, aiming for primary balance is kind of a reasonable thing if, right, this is what I'm building up to, right, if you're happy with the level of debt you have at that time. Right, so for this, from my point of view, for this to be a reasonable assumption of where you want to be in 2035, you've got to feel that you've kind of cleaned up your debt problem that you've inherited from the Great Recession. Right, so you've got the growth of the debt relative to GDP under control, and that you've brought it back down to something you feel comfortable with. Now, people's comfort level differs, right? My view is that aspirationally over decades, we should try to get back to where we were in 2007, right? Which is, you know, in round numbers, 40% of GDP. And the reason for that is we have demonstrated empirically that that's a level of debt where if there's some horrible catastrophe, we can go out and borrow tons and tons of money, trillions and trillions of dollars, and it all works, right? That's basically the federal uh, rainy day fund. And we're now on a trajectory where, you know, I even lose track. We're up somewhere in the, in the high 60s on our way uh, to 70. And, you know, that's probably not a level I'd be comfortable at having be the permanent situation for the U.S. government, right? So we'd like to bring that down. So just note that, that his analysis, if, from my point of view, is essentially assuming that we've cleaned up that problem and gotten down to a reasonable debt level uh, in later years. To the extent you think we're not going to have accomplished that by 2035, uh, then you may actually need a little more action in here with some revenues being dedicated uh, to, or some revenues or lower spending being de dedicated to help bring the debt down faster. Okay, so put those all together, and I think the situation, let's see, I don't want to use bleak, bleak's not a good adjective, <laughs> challenging, right, we rise to challenges, right, the situation is probably a little more challenging than uh, I think the base case that Charlie's emphasized. Um, one other point, just uh, completely unrelated to this analysis, but a thing to think about when you think about the long run structure of the government and taxes and spending. Um, is that we often talk as though taxes and spending are these really distinct categories of activities, that we're taking in money over here and calling it taxes, and then we're spending money over here and calling it spending. And the folks in Washington are much more brilliant than that. Right? So they've managed to make this a very gray thing. We do an enormous amount of spending through the tax code. Uh, I've written lots of things about this. And I just want to emphasize that one of the most important places we do that is healthcare. Right? So the tax advantages for getting, in particular, employer-provided health insurance are gigantic. They're more than $200 billion a year, which is a lot of money. Uh, and as a result, you know, if you think about doing tax reform and you think about ways of getting up revenue, like if you just grabbed me off the street and said, Donald, what's the first thing you would do to raise more revenue and get up to 20.5%, I would say, you know, rethink entirely this tax treatment of health insurance and that makes it much cost much less money. Okay, which I still think, I think that's the right answer. Then we'd start talking about the mortgage interest deduction and carbon taxes and whatnot. Um, but you do note that if this, that's the thing you want to do in order to raise tax revenues and start moving towards the 20.5, just keep in mind that in the course of doing that as a matter of political economics, you may be forcing higher health care spending over some period because some of the subsidy that's delivered that way, politically folks are then going to want to deliver through the spending side of the budget. And so while it's convenient analytically often to talk about the tax and spending side as separable and making separate assumptions about them, I just want to emphasize that under some scenarios where you're doing 
doing things to change the tax trajectory, you've got to keep in mind that you may be implicitly thereby doing something on the spending side, and you can't view them as always being uh, completely uh, separate. Thanks. Wonderful. Donald, thank you. Do we have maybe just a quick question before we call up our final panel? Again, trying to keep us relatively on time. Is there one? Do I see anybody? Going once, going twice? OK, well, then I want to thank Donald and Charlie very much. Um, we'll do our final set change of the day, which also gives me an opportunity to hand the gavel over to Joanne Kennan, who, of course, is the deputy healthcare editor at Politico Pro. Um, I am really excited for this final panel uh, because I'm really curious to know what the answer is that, uh, that we're going to hear to this question of, are we on a sustainable health spending path? I'll give one shameless plug for the Health Research Institute at PWI. We've been tracking medical trend uh, for the last seven or eight years and, in fact, have also identified very similar to what Charlie was talking about, really this flat growth rate for a number of years. And certainly part of that is due, due to the recession, but are there some other underlying factors that are at work and could they continue or are we going to just bounce right back up again when, when we climb out of this recession? So let me turn it over to Joanne. Hi. I guess I um, just want to start briefly with... Uh, I covered the Hill for, with CC for many years, uh, and I covered health care on the Hill. And after I left the Hill and after Senator Daschle left the Hill, we were talking one day, and I said, um, in retrospect, the one mistake I kept making over and over again was waiting for them to make sense. Um, <laughs> so basically, all the assumptions this morning, I mean, if you were going to get to a sustainable level of spending, it does require Congress to actually agree on something. And I don't think um, that's going to happen tomorrow. So that sort of brings us to what's happening in the real world outside of Washington. What are doctors, insurers, hospitals, patients beginning to do? So, uh, and then one of the things that has always interested me is how does it spread? We've gone from sort of islands of excellence to maybe archipelagos of excellence, <laughs> but we don't have systemic excellence. So um, I think both of you can, you know, how do we make what works happen elsewhere? How do we prevent from what doesn't work from continuing not to work? Who wants you want to go first? Uh, sure. I, I have a few slides to go through. And we can do, you want to do them from here or you want to go? Whatever you like. Right. You want the clicker? Yeah, please. Thanks. I think we were going to approach this as a bit of a round table, so I'll try to keep the presentation part short and without spiffy charts for the most part. Um, <laughs> I work with the Pacific Business Group on Health, and I thought I'd start by giving you kind of our, our marquee, uh, just to give you a flavor for the kinds of companies we work with. And as what they all share in common is a concern about cost and the quality of care they provide to their employees and families they cover. And Arnie has been with us for a very long time, and, and you, thankfully you've heard his perspective already. And as he said, I'll give you a little more of a drill down to where the employer's thinking is today. And we can talk some about the uh, islands of excellence, if you like. But I think the question of spread and sustainability of any of the innovations which may be cost-saving and lead to sustainable overall spending is a real, that Joanne just teed up, is a real challenging question. And as, as Arnie gave the example of the Boeing work, one of our important members, we have a number of members who are doing those kinds of projects in one setting or another, but they are very modest in their overall impact. They're very much not scalable without enormous effort. And so the interdependency between public policy and private effort is an important theme for us to talk about. Um, I would say the main, we just had a retreat with these folks about a month ago, and while I think no one wants to say a lot about this in public, the risk of employer exit is a very serious risk. And I would say an undercurrent for all the discussion today, and I don't know, Charlie, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how this plays into the charts, is if you imagine a scenario of, of rapid employer exit over the next 10 to 15 years from the employer-sponsored coverage, either through a defined contribution or some other mechanism, and therefore you see a rapid escalation of the enrollment in Medicaid and in subsidized exchange cover coverage, what does that do to the scenarios we just looked at for the last hour or so? And I haven't seen that modeling done, and maybe it has been, but I think it's worth our time to think about the prospects of employer exit and what that means for public uh, funding of, of health care, um, as well as the quality of care and, and the health of the country as a whole, if, if that scenario were to play out. 
So um, obviously the scenario for our, my members is one of, of dramatic escalation in total cost that they're incurring. And this chart is just, I'm sure it's hard to see the, the labeling here. The lower numbers are the, um, uh, the, the upper numbers of the escalation, both the employer contribution to premium and the employee contribution to premium, which are more or less keeping pace, but at a very steep curve. So the impact on both the employee and the company is, is very substantial over these, this time period. And as you see, the, the top lines there, wage growth has been very significantly affected by this. Profitability has been affected. And employers are giving serious thought to what op options they have to escape these trend lines over time. And I think we've said this for 20 years. It's not sustainable in quotes. The question now is, do they mean it? And what would be the tipping point at which prominent employers leaving the market would drive many employers to do the same thing? And what would be the consequences for the topics we're discussing today? So does it matter? Should we keep employers in the game? Does it matter to the federal budget? Does it matter to the country's well-being as a whole? Um, the benefits of keeping employers engaged, may not be, we don't often make them explicit. Um, the employer is close to the worker and their family. They're close to their health care, to their health needs, to the resources those people may uh, need. And they see them eight, ten hours a day. So they have an opportunity for direct contact with people about their circumstances of their knowledge, their health, their responses to the health care system. Um, many employers, certainly my employers, are linking their wellness strategies to their medical strategies. So the opportunity that we all talk about but don't do much about of dealing with prevention and health improvement and wellness and community health as a strategy to reduce cost is one that is most tractable actually to the employer compared to almost any other actor in the healthcare system because the employer does have a big impact on the community as a whole. Um, thirdly, they can manipulate the consumer's contribution structure. So the employer, as Arnie said earlier, has the advantage of actually being able to work with the consumer incentives much more than the public programs are able to do for political and, and other uh, justice and equity reasons. Um, fourth, they're close to the delivery systems in their community. They actually often sit on the boards of the hospitals and other healthcare organizations in the community. So the employer has direct leverage with the delivery system if they choose to exercise it, and that's another story. They are active purchasers. That is, they actually get into the market and get their hands dirty, again, much more so than the very broadly defined public programs are able to do. They can pool lives and create pressure on providers, and they can pool political voice and put pressure on the public sector. So I think as advocates, if you like, they are important players in the marketplace. Again, they have the leverage, if they choose to exercise it, to drive behavior, whether it's episode pricing or capitation or realignment of medical delivery systems, they can do that in the real world. Now, there are some drawbacks to keeping the employers actively in the game. They only cover a large portion, a half or so of the population. They are extremely fragmented. And even the very large employers I work with, the Walmarts and GEs and Verizons, are tiny little droplets in the sea of the, uh, the marketplace. So they're uh, very ineffective at mobilizing large pressure on the behavior of the provider or even the payer side. Um, they have mixed motives, which certainly is perceived by the employee and by the public, but it's also real. They do have pressure for, to, for their shareholders and from their management to achieve cost savings without necessarily as much care around quality. My members are very progressive companies, and they care deeply about quality, and they measure it, and they reward it. But that is not necessarily true of your average local dry cleaner and repair shop who doesn't have the tools to do that kind of worry, and they worry about the cost that they can bear as an employer. Um, there are varied levels of sophistication among the employer community. You can't assume they're all at the level of companies that I work with. Um, they don't maintain continuity of employment over time, of course, so that subjects people to all kinds of churn and the effects of churn in the marketplace. And finally, we have the historic problems of job lock and now the retiree cliff, which is when you lose your, when you retire from employment, you're really out of luck in the current environment. And I'll give you a little data on that in a minute. So are purchasers, my companies, on a sustainable path? Just to mirror the conversation of the morning, I would just say no period. They don't think they are. They're not acting as if they are. They're contemplating much more dramatic changes in their programs than they did three, four, five years ago. Um, what would be sustainable? The CPI plus zero we just finished talking about, or GDP plus zero. Any kind of uh, trend bending along those lines is, is considered essential. And just to remind you, I guess the obvious, my companies are the American economy, so they are only going to grow at that rate, whatever we decide that is, and they can't really fathom why they should tr keep taking 2 or 5% out of their rate of growth to subsidize another sector of the economy. Um, the, I would just put a the footnote there on same for total cost of care, just to distinguish while, of course, my companies are very sensitive to premium, what they're actually paying as a contribution, and of course, many of them are self-funded. The total cost of care is what they really wanted to look at more and more, and I already showed you a little bit of data along those lines. <clears throat> 
they want a durable reduction in the cost shift, and we can argue whether the cost shift is 3% or 20%, but they believe they are paying a substantial premium for the low fixed prices paid by public payers. And as we contemplate in Congress and elsewhere, changes in the eligibility age, changes in the payment structure, the employers just see that as you're asking me to pay more, you're asking me to pay more. That's the only message they see when they hear those conversations in Congress. So they're looking for, as you discuss sustainability in the federal budget, they are looking for a sustainable understanding of what is the cost shift going to be. Not just that it's sustainable for the federal treasury, but it's sustainable for those who are paying potentially a differential from the private sector. Um, they, want to they want to compete on benefits. They actually like the role they play in competing for retention and attracting workers with their benefit program. So they would like to be able to do that and to be able to use reasonable consumer incentives. These are all capitalists. They like the idea of incenting consumer behavior to seek, as Arnie has described it, the high-performing providers, the low-fuel-using providers. The employers want to play that role. They want to retain that function, but they're feeling that they may not be able to sustain it. Um, what else they would like is um, something a little softer, if you like. They'd like to know that their employees are going to get good outcomes when they go to seek care. And to the extent we ratchet out, we cannibalize the, the technology and service quality of the healthcare system, they are not going to be happy about that. So they want to see a sustainable capability of delivering good outcomes. They want to have confidence in reliability. In other words, they see enormous variation in cost and quality today. And when an employee randomly walks into one place, for a service versus another place for that service, they're likely to get dramatically different results at dramatically different prices with no consciousness about that. So they want to see reliability increased and how do we achieve that during this transition. And then finally, they're capitalists. They believe in a competitive marketplace. They believe in continuous innovation, driving improvement and efficiency. So they want to see all those things listed here as the environment in which healthcare is delivered. So that's what my folks are looking for. Um, are, so that's what they want. Do they have it today? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, pretty much on each of the uh, dimensions I, I flagged there, we've obviously continued to have trended two or three times the general rate of inflation. Um, the offer rate is declining. The uptake rate is declining. The effectiveness of coverage is declining. These high deductible plans are, are really eroding the um, availability of services for an awful lot of people of moderate and low incomes. So they're not seeing that being sustained. Transparency is going nowhere. We all talk about transparency. We have tiny little glimmers of light in transparency. But today, a typical Safeway checker has you know, very little ability to determine where they're going to get care, at what price, and with what kinds of expected result. Uh, the Massachusetts legislation that's pending is actually a nice model of trying to amp up the, the transparency component. Um, the benefits are, are effectively declining that people are getting. Outcomes, we have almost no outcome data today to make judgments as to where to direct patients with our differential benefit programs. So we've been discussing this forever. We have a ton of process measures that have made it through the measurement enterprise, as they call it today. But those are not effectively being used for purchaser or consumer decision making after 20 years of trying. We really aren't there. So we've got to get much more serious about measuring the quality of the health outcomes. Uh, reliability remains very volatile. And the competitive marketplace we're seeing going the wrong way from our point of view, which is toward more consolidation, hospitals buying doctors, plans buying hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. And that is not yet giving us confidence that we're going to see a more competitive, innovative marketplace. So how do we get there? I pretty much have flagged the kind of dimensions we think are needed, transparency, outcomes, measurement, understandable units of service. This is the debate uh, Bob and I were just chatting about episodes. I think the question is, what is the unit of service people compete on that you can see the price and see the result? we got to come up with something which is tractable to the consumer if we're going to have a consumer-oriented marketplace. Um, pretty much all these things. Trans monitoring and transparency, I think, is something the employers love to see. And then uh, relaxed regulatory inhibitions on care redesign. I can't find a more elegant way to say that. But rethinking our regulatory infrastructure to encourage innovation using modern technologies and service models that have not been prevalent. This is just a chart from this meeting we had a month ago. This is the clarity with which employers are thinking today. Um, <laughs> it's laser-like in knowing exactly what, what, you, what we should do. But the, the good news is they're thinking all these thoughts. The bad news is we don't have the answer either. Sorry, Joanne. Um, these are the, the, there are two charts. I only brought this one. But this one is the company's strategy for health benefits over the next 10 years. You see 46% are more or less going to stay the course which means 54% are seriously considering not staying the course. A more dramatic number I don't have here, um, someone just did a survey of, will you still be offering health benefits 10 years from now? And only 23% said yes. 
So somewhere in their heads, this may not be a, tr uh, a true idea, but it's an idea for 77% of them that we got to find another way to play. And it's not the way we, all of you, are assuming that sector is going to stay constant. They don't think it is. So in terms of the policy implications for this uh, somewhat bleak story, our members feel health reform has to actually address medical costs, not just government expenditures. So the conversation we're having today has to be broadened, as it was in our panels today, to talk about total expenditure. Um, it can't just shift costs to employers or to beneficiaries, whether public or private sector beneficiaries. Uh, traditional fee-for-service is obviously a culprit, and we have to uh, be active in addressing that. And there should be consumer incentives to shop wisely for high-performing providers and create a market signal to reward that. So payment reform, benefit redesign, we can certainly do that in the private sector, much more complex in the public sector. Um, delivery system redesign of the kind we've all talked about. And then infrastructure, we haven't talked so much about it today, but to address the quality, transparency, pricing issues, uh, market oversight, regulatory questions, we've got to have a deeper look at our infrastructure. We have some more tools we didn't have 10 years ago, but we aren't really knitting them together very well. So that's something that public policy can go further in doing. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, David, I thought you did a great job. And I have some slides, too. And I think it's gonna, they're going to follow very nicely from uh, where you left off. Um, the answer to Joanne's question is I also agree uh, that the answer is no. And I think there are positive signs of life, but I think that we really have to reorient how not only we're talking about the uh, health care issues, but how we're thinking about them in the context of the political discussion here in Washington. And I think, Joanne, you're leading us right to the correct discussion. Uh, just three introductory points to open. One, uh, it's very, very curious that if you think back to health reform, it was very specifically focused on the numbers of people who didn't have coverage and the expectation that any policy would have to bring two-thirds, three-quarters in, right? Everybody talked about that as a goal. We do not have a similar goal with respect to health care costs, and that's where I think we should start. What is our goal? Is it Charlie's goal? Is it taking a, a trillion or two trillion out a future rate of growth? Whatever it is, we have to start talking about specific goals or we are never getting anywhere, number one. Number two, if you think about it in four tranches, I'm looking at Linda, as CBO projects out four tranches, Medicare, Medicaid, tax expenditures, and subsidies now, that we're going to be spending roughly $17 trillion over the next 10 years. $17 trillion. So the question is, can we take a trillion or two off that. That's the conversation we ought to be having. You got at it in your charts in exactly the same way, but it might be simpler for people to think that way. It focuses the mind because then you can think about, well, how do you orient progress toward that goal, number one. Number two, I think the issue that clears a crowded political room quicker than a fire is the following, that healthcare right now to the extent we have any economic growth, the healthcare sector is fueling it. And we are not connecting the dots in terms of how that affects the overall economy. And whether that's positive, negative, where does it lead us? I'm not making a value judgment, but no one is connecting the dots. Three, David talked about the interdependency of public and private strategies. I think that is crucial, and it's a crucial prism through which to have this discussion. One, what's the government role? Two, what's the private sector role? Three, where do they cross in terms of our you know, high school geometry, if you make those little diagrams? So that's what I'd like to talk about today. I'm going to skip some of my slides in the interest of time. I want to go right here. I know Len, um, thank you very much, used our slide and our map in terms of what is going on around the country. And um, we're getting more sophisticated with our map, so very soon we'll be able to click on each state and show you exactly what is going on. So let me take it from the standpoint of changes in reimbursement structures. Uh, we are very actively negotiating with hospitals uh, prospective payments. Not a one-size-fits-all. It depends on the ability of a hospital and interest and hospital to take risk. So there's a continuum of possibilities and opportunities there. I've seen data from very specific health plans with their provider partners where we're actually showing reductions in the slope of the curve. These kinds of strategies work. Two, 
bundling, and everyone's talked about bundling episodes, whatever work, uh, word you want to use. What's very exciting now, it used to be primarily everybody knows about joints, everybody knows about pregnancy. Now we're seeing a very significant efforts, health plans collaborating with provider specialists and their provider partners in the area of cancer care, beginning to think about incentives, both quality and cost and bundling payments so you're not paying on a piece rate basis. So the providers are incented, um, we're incented to support them with data, and the uh, delivery system moves in the right direction. Third bucket, um, the issue of medical homes. We've talked a lot about um, the concept of medic medical homes. And the way it basically works, health plans now are putting care coordinators either directly in doctor's offices or uniting doctors who are in single or two-person, three-person practices, uniting them virtually with um, uh, physician, with uh, nursing support, so they know which patients, because of the ability to do predictive modeling, which patients are likely to have chronic conditions. How do you get them into the system early? How do you make sure that they are managed and their diseases are organized? So if I present with asthma, I'm I might also have congestive heart, I might have diabetes. How do you organize their care? Basic kinds of structures, but they work. And I'm beginning to see data about reductions in hospital admissions, reductor, reductions in ER usage, et cetera. So I think there's a real exciting opportunity there. The second area, and obviously in the interest of time, I'm not going to spend too much on each of these areas, but empowering patients. Something very fundamentally happened with the prescription drug legislation. With the Part D program, we began to develop tiering structures, albeit in prescription drugs. That methodology, coupled with the investments in infrastructure, now we are rolling out to hospitals, doctors, and so on. That, so we ha we're, you're going to be getting, beginning to see in the market, employers have been very... Um, uh, much uh, supportive and urging health plans to do this so that you look at tiers. Tier one, highest quality, lowest cost. Tier two, et cetera. And you, I won't spend too much time on it. But you can then create incentives for individual employees, individuals purchasing on their own, to use tier one providers. And then that has a sentinel effect um, as Jack Rogers worked on many years ago, the concept still works as we see it again and again in communities because hospitals and doctors want to be on tier one. So you can think about the whole productivity aspect laid on. You also can think about from a beneficiary point of view, you know, incenting people to get health risk appraisals, get a fill, I have asthma, filling my prescriptions and incenting me to do that so I don't end up in the ER. Basic kinds of strategies. Again, we could talk a long time about this but these are the kinds of demand side, uh, looking at the individual and their ability to uh, spark change, coupled with negotiating a very different reimbursement kind of system, moving away from fee-for-service. We can't continue fee-for-service and hope to solve this problem. Um, then we get to the, some of the challenges. And I want to say, David, you did a great job, so I want to just come behind him and not repeat what David said. Two years ago in the health care debate, <clears throat> we said to most of the other stakeholders as well as members of Congress that we have a unit cost problem. Now, what does that mean? It's a wonky term. Um, all of you in this room know about this. For people watching on the web, it's what are, what are the prices? What are the charges from different actors within the delivery system? When we produce premiums, it is the result of what we are being charged. We have a unit cost problem because the prices continue to grow very significantly. Again, that also clears a crowded Capitol Hill room very quickly because my cost containment is someone else's revenue reduction, right? We have not been able to cross the Rubicon and attack that because it seems any time you propose strategies to deal with that, it seems that as if you are against jobs, against local economic recovery, et cetera, et cetera. We have to attack the price. The reimbursement changes I talk about and I talked about begin to do that exactly. And there are some very path-breaking 
um, providers, hospital systems that are very interested in partnering to address this issue because they understand, as we do, that this system cannot be sustained the way it is today. Um, <clears throat> I want to skip over to productivity. Productivity, if you look at a couple of the other issues, I, I just picked out variation, you did too. Safety, that's another way to talk about it. We have 10 conditions that the Institute of Medicine has been talking about and ARC and so on for many years about wide variation. Well, we need to get that, we need to shrink that variation. It is a very simple thing to talk about, a very hard thing to do. Is it hard for the health plans? Absolutely not. Two years ago, I was um, telling Arnie that uh, we propose that there be a process where we work with specialty societies and with other clinicians to agree on what are the best practices, flow it through the reimbursement system, get this cleaned up, and increase the productivity. You could do that immediately. We were told very, very clearly that was too hard for the provider community. It was too difficult politically. So I, I want to go directly to that because you asked the question about politics. What, how, does, how do politics come into this? Unless we are really clear-mindedly focused on the objective of wringing costs out of the system that don't need to be there, that shouldn't be there, that are wrong from a patient perspective, we want best practices, patients. Employers want it, individuals want it, et cetera. But we have to start having this conversation where A relates to B, relates to see and how do they all relate together. Sounds glib. It is not simple. It's very simple to design reimbursement strategies to address this. Politically, it is not simple at all. And I'm going to come back to that. Measures. We have to, Dave is absolutely right, we have to, we have 500 so process measures. We have to step back and say, what are the 15, 20 high value measures that we're going to use in the private sector, in the public sector, so doctors and hospitals are not tortured? We clean this up when deal with outcomes very, very specifically. Increasing productivity. Everybody loves to talk about productivity today. Healthcare and education are the laggards in terms of productivity compared to every other sector. We can, do, we can help, we can play a very important role in the health plan community, but there has to be the political will to attack this problem. Scope of practice. This is, again, an area that clears a crowded room because we're talking about using other healthcare practitioners. Now, hospitals have done some wonderful thinking. You guys have done some wonderful thinking about this in your facilities, too, I know. How do we use nurses and other practitioners to help? We don't have enough primary care physicians. How do we get primary care physicians to work to the top of their license? And how do we use nurses and other practitioners? We've got to have a debate about that, and we've got to change laws all around the country to make that possible. Then consolidation. I want to say a few words about consolidation. We've got hospitals, um, horizontal, I want to talk about horizontal, which means the following. Large hospital systems buying, eating up smaller, lower cost hospitals. What are the implications of that? Health plan gets a call from that great hospital system that has a fantastic reputation that everybody in this room wants to go to and says, guess what? We have just bought hospital A and B. Now you're going to be going in hospital A and B from 100% of Medicare by way of reimbursement to 150 to 160 to 170 for the privilege of dealing with us overnight. There it is. You don't think that increases costs? Yes, it does. That's the horizontal consolidation. Vertical, we used to pay for cardiac caths on an outpatient basis. Hospitals buy physicians. I'm not going to talk about pro or con the reasons. The fact is that it's happening in the delivery system today. The cardiac cath just has now an overhead increase of 30 to 40 percent. That increases costs. Then we go to any uh, any city, large city, and m most of the mid-sized cities in this country, we have a building and construction boom in the hospital arena. You add, that's a trifecta of creating overhead from a hospital perspective demands that are impossible to sustain over time. We are not talking about that at all in the public policy community because it's hard to do it. But unless we actually begin to address these fundamental issues, whether it's hard or not, we're going to not make any, um, any progress. I'm going to leave the other. Um, we can talk about that if you care to. But I want to just go to, OK, what do we do? 
first, payment changes in public programs. The, we have to move away from fee-for-service. One of the most, I think, important developments on the Medicaid side is um, with uh, the movement toward uh, beginning to coordinate care for the dual eligibles to get people out of nursing homes who want to be at home. We have the ability to do that, um, working uh, appropriately with the disability groups, working with other patient groups, understanding what their expectations are, but moving people out of places they don't want to be and getting them back to the community. Not only does it save money, that's not shouldn't be the primary reason to do it. It's where people want to be. And as all of the baby boomers move into their retirement years, that's where all of us are going to want to be. So moving toward dual eligibles and thinking about that as a population population and what they need to be supported. In the Medicare arena, my colleague Jeff Lemieux, who runs our research center, has done uh, quite a great deal of research looking at Medicare Advantage versus the traditional fee-for-service area in a range of areas, but readmissions. We do a better job because we have coordinated care. We work with the hospitals. Uh, partnering. This is not, we don't go under a blanket and do it by ourselves. We partner. Th these things work when you partner, disease management, care coordination with hospitals, with clinicians, et cetera, to make sure people understand their orders when they come out of a hospital. They understand um, and they have the uh, the support system at home. They have their prescriptions for a couple of days, so they don't have to go out and get their prescriptions if they're not able. Again, simple kinds of things. There's tremendous potential now to broaden uh, these kinds of disease management, care coordination, and moving away from fee-for-service in the Medicare program, per se. Better awareness of hotspots, that sort of, um, I think we talked a lot about that today, but where is all this taking us? What are the resource demands of various hospitals? How do you deal with that? How can we help on the reimbursement side, et cetera? We've been doing a great deal of work looking at different communities, and you can see a very strong correlation between rates of increase in health care costs and consolidation. There's no doubt about it. We'll have a lot more to say about that in future research reports, but you can see it around the country. So we have to begin to talk about what are the needs of hospitals, what are the needs of communities, what are the needs of clinicians, how are we going to address all these issues ex uh, versus putting our head in the sand. We, th we think that there is a tremendous opportunity for state engagement here. Lower to the ground, we have to take on public health challenges, and they're different in every state. We have to begin to think about stakeholders working together. And it's very hard to develop a recipe for that in DC. It's too easy for stakeholders to walk away, as we saw back uh, two years ago in the health reform discussion. It's very hard to walk away from a governor. And I think that you have more opportunity there to uh, begin to get different constituencies working together. And then finally, I just want to say several things about um, provisions in the ACA in terms of unintended consequences. Um, we strongly support the goal of bringing people into the system, but it will not be able to be sustained unless there's affordability. And I think there needs to be now, between now and 14, much more attention on what do people have now, what do small employers, not necessarily large, because large employers, although you may be shy of a couple of benefits, from a small employer perspective and an individual buying on their own, you're talking about largely catastrophic coverage. They're not buying 10 categories of coverage. They're not buying vertically um, the low deductibles in the legislation. Although all of us would support that, the question is how you get from here to there. We have to look at the implications on that small employer, on the individual. Secondly, um, we have to look at there's a, a premium tax that now is part of the legislation. That's going to add just a little shy of 3% to a small business purchasing coverage. Everybody in this room understands from a standpoint of, four per, of, of a small business, a 3% increase or 2.5 is a material increase. 
You put that together with a small business that may be offering a catastrophic coverage package, not because that's what he or she wants to do, it's the only thing they can afford right now. You look at the combination of that, that's a cost increase. The third thing, in 85% of the market, um, older people are paying roughly five times or more uh, relative to younger people. It's called a rating ban. That collapses to 3% overnight in 85% of the market. The people you need in the pools for the pooling to work are the younger and the healthier people. So the implications of those three things um, on younger and healthier people, and I don't just mean people, the young immortals in their 20s. I mean people who are in their 30s and early 40s. You have to have those people in the pool. So as we talk about these macro issues with respect to health care, what does the private sector do? What does the public sector do? And how can we work together <clears throat> in a productive way? What we want to do now that there is certainty around the Supreme Court decision is make sure that people are looking now while there's time at some of these indigenous factors that we think can be transitioned, can, there are strategies to address them before things actually begin to happen in 14. So I think that's sort of what we're looking at in terms of your question in terms of sustainability. The, um, in, in, in watching the early stages of implementation, obviously lots of things were on hold until the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And you just alluded to greater certainty. But when we call people, we, now we're hearing, well, we have to wait for the election. So the clock keeps getting pushed back. How, in, in the private sector, is there, are you seeing, or either of you seeing, or both of you seeing more of a, okay, post SCOTUS, we are moving ahead. The assumption is we need to start making up for lost time. Joanne, I can take you to any health plan, either here or in any state in the country. They've set up special task forces. Uh, we have had regulations issued every several days, 500 pages, 400 pages, 300 pages, what have you, on all these different components. Any plan that seeks to be in the market in 2014 has um, committed to implementation in a very significant way. There was no waiting until for certainty in the Supreme Court. There are expectations, there are markers, and we've proceeded. You haven't heard of any um, health plan that's missed a deadline, and there have been many, because we're, there has been this very significant effort to make sure we were doing everything that was expected, and it's been huge in terms of implementation. So we're, we're very, very focused on what the country is expecting of us, what the requirements are. There was never, maybe in the political system you hear this, but on the ground, no way. There's but no there is that intersection. You can only plan so far. I mean, the and, and we get these, I mean, I get these emails from employer survey groups saying they're not ready with this, they're not ready with that. Not the health plans, yeah. but employers. And it may be more the small employers than the big employers. But we're we are constantly getting a deluge of people who, who are on hold. And they're on hold for this, and then they're on hold for that. So there's there's also a connect where the health plans have to work in a state environment, and the state environment is highly uncertain. Well, the state, for example, there are some states that have said to um, health plans that Washington State, for example, has said that they want all of the bids for the uh, all the metal levels at the beginning of next year. Um, you can't develop your bids until you have all of the rules um, signed, sealed, and delivered. So, you know, that is an issue of, you know, it's sort of like the scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz, you know, pointing both directions, and they're not the same. So what that will occasion quite a lot of discussion with states about we can't give you X, Y, Z until we know all of the specifics. But I suspect that some of the comments that you get from people who are, are not ready, a number of small employers are really struggling because we speak with them quite a lot about how do they get from where they are today in terms of what they're providing to 10 categories of benefits and a very big extension in terms of they may have deductibles of $4,000 now, then going down to two. That has a material impact in terms of the cost of coverage for them. And then you add in a premium tax 
so small employers are very concerned, and I think they're just not sure how they navigate. And I, I, there's definitely some of that. And David can speak to the large employers that are very busy doing a range of things on the cost side, as David eloquently said. Yeah, I'd, I'd say three things in terms of the uh, Supreme Court decision, the election, and the pace implementation. First, people tend to underestimate that the large employers, all employers, have a very significant administrative implementation task. So in 2014 in particular, there are, I think we counted 21 different things an employer has to do to comply with the law. So they have their hands full, and, and as Karen said, they are busy doing it as if it's going to happen. And that's a huge amount of work for them that they've absorbed. Uh, the second is the Medicaid expansion uncertainty that's been introduced by the Supreme Court decision is beginning to ripple through the employer community because they realize that for their low-income, uh, low-wage employees, part-time seasonal employees, that could really change the environment in which their employees are getting coverage state by state. And for a large multi-state employer, that's going to be a nightmare. So they're beginning to think about what's their policy position. Are they going to start advocating with the states to accept the expansion and really p reposition themselves than, than where they've been in the past? Um, so that's a new wrinkle for them as a result. Do you of have a stance on that and what they need to do? With I think they're, all, they're evaluating it. I don't, I don't think they've done the modeling to figure out what it means for them and how it fits with their overall positioning on, on health reform. But it's a new question that they weren't anticipating until a few weeks ago. Um, but then the third thing is fundamentally it doesn't matter. Their pressures are cost, cost, cost. The uh, ACA as implemented is not expected to do much to relieve them of the cost pressure they feel. Um, so they are really focused on what's the next generation of both private sector and public sector actions that will mitigate the cost trend. And so to that extent, they're not paying a lot of attention to the question you asked. They're focused on what can we do to mobilize people around really changing the healthcare system to become affordable. Okay. Anyone? Questions? Are we time? Question for uh, Karen. Um, uh, Karen, when, when uh, insurance plans are competing against each other, mm -hmm. and when uh, insurance plan A is working with few doctors on helping them set up a medical home for their insured, then insurance plan B avoids these doctors and goes to another one, which create, makes, creates the nightmare, the impossibility of these doctors spreading the medical home to all their patients. Um, what's your gut feeling? Can we see in, in your can you see in your crystal ball a, a world where um, um, multiple plans come together and say, "I'm going to go to these physicians that are engaged with Medicare already, and I'm going to say, okay, the 80 percent of your patients who are not on Medicare, I'm going to help you do the same thing, so that this this practice pattern snowballs and changes everybody's practice." Uh, What's your prediction? I think this is a, a very important question you've asked. And um, in a couple of states now, we're seeing exactly that happen, where Medicare um, is now partnering also with the private sector. So you have a state like Pennsylvania, for example, had a number of health plans developing medical homes, um, now working with Medicare to actually move this forward. So I think we're going to see much more of that around the country. And the primary care physicians are very open to it because, A, a number of them want to maintain their own practices. So having we have the infrastructure, the data, to connect them virtually. They have coverage now where they didn't have coverage before and so on and so forth. And we've been spending a great deal of time talking about how now to work more broadly within various communities. So I, yes, I think that's definitely what's going to happen. And then you add this idea of syncing up the measures so you're not tortured by a number of different measures, public, private, and so on. And you could really begin to see, to map out how you go from here to there very, very productively. The whole SGR discussion, you know, kind of you've led me to this. Really, um, if, if you think about moving away, we should be having a conversation rather than how to sustain and f afford SGR and doing away with it and doing these patches, how to change the reimbursement fundamentally. And you do that, you solve the SGR problem. So there are a whole bunch of things you could do, I think, very productively. I could follow up on your SGR comment, Karen. That's so popular with the cardiologist I talk to, I know, all the time. We're budget people, mm -hmm. most of us, mm -hmm. but yeah, he's, he's a doctor, mm -hmm. he's a provider, and we all know we can't get anywhere unless the provider community right. and the doctors and nurses are really behind it. 
But I walk in, my name is Tom, I'm an economist, ask me how to cut costs by cutting employment and cutting your wages. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough sell. Clears a crowded room, right? <laughs> there you go. You haven't cleared this one yet. <laughs> no. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> no? Other questions? Okay. Well, in that case, um, I want to thank our concluding panel and, and Joanne, first of all. <laughs> Remind everyone that there is a lunch provided uh, straight through the doors in the back. Um, uh, also, Altaram is on the web. I happen to know that Charlie blogs because I follow him. They also tweet and watch for the monograph of this session. Thank you.